I want to introduce our guest speaker tonight, and I want to do it in a way that he's probably never been introduced before because I am the only person who can introduce him this way. <laughs> now, there, amongst free Methodists, uh, we, and Methodists in general, we, we are just in love with John Wesley. You know that. <clears throat> And there's a story about John Wesley, and, and way back when, 1500s, John uh, said that he uh, went to a meeting on Aldersgate Street, and he heard somebody reading the preface to Romans, which is intensely boring, and, and his heart was strangely warmed. He was pricked by the power of the Holy Spirit, and something changed inside him during that meeting. And Wesley was never the same, and he went on to lead revivals and do all. Before that, he didn't amount to a whole lot, but after that, something incredible happened to Wesley. And so uh, the, the power of the, of the anointing of the Holy Spirit came on him in that unlikely meeting on Aldersgate Street. I was invited years ago to a, a similar style meeting in Washington, D.C. by my friend Eric Brown. Be back before Eric was a, he was the youth pastor, but he wasn't the associate here. And he said, hey, why don't you come with me down to Washington, D.C.? And I'm like, dude, that's like five or six hours away. I'm not driving down there. To see Todd White. And I'm like, Todd White? That guy wears toe shoes. I'm not, he's, he's got hair that looks like the head of a mop. I'm not going down there. You know, but, but I didn't say that. I said, um, let me pray about it. <laughs> That's Pastor E's for, I'll get back to you never. <laughs> and, and, but, you know, the, the, I, I thought, this guy's in ministry training. You know, he's a young guy. He's looking for some, he's looking for some support from his senior pastor. And, and I, I called him back. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go with you. So we went down to Washington, D.C. I went like Wesley went, quite unwillingly. Now, I didn't have a critical spirit. I wanted to hear what all the hubbub was about, but I went intensely listening to hear anything that was different from, from the, the holiness philosophy in which I had been raised. I went with a razor's edge, my pen ready, thinking, I wanted, if, if, if this weird-looking guy goes off the rails up there, I want to know where it went off, right? Because I already knew enough to know that there was some good coming out of it. There's some good happening there, right? But I wanted to know if it was getting weird anywhere. <laughs> that sounds bad now, doesn't it, Dan? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Todd came out and he was weird. Um, but in a godly, in a as Todd was speaking, I was thinking to myself, there isn't anything going on on the stage right now that couldn't happen at a free Methodist camp meeting. Wow. Wow. And then Dan came out, and Dan started preaching. He never got to the text that he gave us. Right? Eric and I opened up our Bibles. He said, we're going from this text, and we never saw it again. We were gone. I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> But it was all right from the Holy Spirit. I mean, it was powerful. And, and so that night, just before we left, uh, Todd and Dan and a whole bunch of others prayed over us. And, and, and I said to myself, Lord, is, I, this is a new experience for me. This is something new for me. What's going on here? Uh, help me know if this is authentic. Help me know if this is genuine. Help me know if this is legitimate or it's just hype. And we drove the whole way back from Washington, D.C., got here just in time for church the next morning. I think we had 30 minutes of sleep, preached through two sermons, and had energy to spare. And after that, I thought, this is no joke. You don't fake that kind of energy, right? God was moving. And ever since then, it's created this hunger in me. This desire in me, this, this aspiration, I don't want to put Dan up on any pedestal here, but this, this aspiration to have the kind of walk that I see Dan modeling. And I pray for that. And so uh, without any further ado, I just want to bring Dan up to the stage. God bless you, brother. I know the Holy Spirit works through you. You don't need any more introduction than that. And so I'm just going to pray that God does whatever he wants to do through you tonight. Amen. Father, fill him with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, sir. Give me a hug. Love you, brother. 
Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, my goodness. That was a different introduction. That was really good. <laughs> you were cracking me up. <laughs> but you were being very real. He was being very real. When you go to something new, you have all kinds of thoughts inside that you usually don't talk about. And so I was totally tracking your story. It was just hilarious. Because I was one of the speakers. I mean, I, I'm just honored. Like, you guys got to understand something. Like, I'm here because I want to be here. I'm not here because I have to be. I want to be. I have no requests. I, I, I ask for nothing. I stay in a home. I believe the gospel. Jesus changed my life. This isn't my way of living. I'm not here so you put bread on my table. I never ask for an honorarium. I never ask for an offering. I buy all my own plane tickets. It usually costs me to go to a meeting. Last year, 70% of the churches I went to, I took no honorarium. 70% took zero. What are we in? The end of February, beginning of March. We're in the beginning of March. I've already been to four recovery centers and a teen ranch for troubled teenage boys. And I take zero from those places. And we're only in what week of the year? And I've already been to five recovery centers. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I buy my plane ticket and pay to get there. Why? Because Jesus hung on a cross to redeem my life. And if I pay for a plane ticket and go and share a truth that helps redeem somebody else's life, what's a plane ticket? If I'm in this thing for me, something's going to be dull. If I'm in it for him and his great name and for your sake, something's going to be sharp. <laughs> Amen. So now that I set you up to cut you, because it's going to be sharp. No. <laughs> See, I just slid right in there now. Now I'm going to cut you all. <laughs> I'm just here to have fun, man. I'm going to preach the gospel. Jesus changed my life 29 years ago. 29 months? No, 29 years. I'm alive. I'm on fire. I didn't come to you tired. I'm not jaded. I'm not hurt by people. Life's not speaking louder than truth and eating my lunch. I'm having the time of my life in Jesus. Doesn't mean I don't have challenges. Doesn't mean I don't have trials. Doesn't mean I don't go through the same things you go through. Because the Bible says don't think it's strange when you're going through something like you're going through. Because your brothers all over the world are going through the same stuff. So don't think it's strange. Pastor, you did something amazing. You got up here and you had us hold our hands out. And you said, if you're serious, pray this prayer for God to... Challenge and change anything in us that he wants to. So I don't know if you participated in that. But I'm going to trust that you did. Because the number one thing that I found that we have sincerely misunderstood, if that's fair. You know, sometimes people do things intentionally. Sometimes they do things unintentionally. There's a such thing called as ignorance, unawareness. The one thing I've seen that people don't understand is their motive for being a Christian. And I found that most people are a Christian for their own well-being. You bear with me. We held our hands out and prayed. I'm going to go back to that and keep blaming it on your pastor. No, come on. We're Christians for our own well-being, not Christians for his namesake and the sake of others. And I'm not sure. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about at large, body of Christ. I'm not sure how many of us have actually understood that we gave our life to be a Christian. That we denied our self. I've seen a whole lot of people very much alive in themselves, their own feelings, their circumstances, their troubles, people issues, tit for tat, he said, she said. And if you're not a Christian for his namesake, ultimately he'll even be the one that you look to and question and have trouble with. I've seen a lot of people that go to church even mad at God because their motive for being a Christian never started off right. You don't come to God for what he can do for you. You come to God so that he restores you back to what he intended you to be in the first place. Now, we sang that song tonight. That for the redemption of humanity, he despised the shame of the cross. Redemption means brought back, Pastor, you know this. Bought back, brought back to original value. 
So why did Jesus die on the cross? To forgive our sins? That's part of the cross. The cross brings forgiveness, which is vital so we can get to God. But the reason he hung on the cross was to bring redemption. That means to bring people back to the original reason they're here in the first place. If you just prayed a prayer to go to heaven, you're missing out big time on all the fun. And life is eating your lunch. No, no. If you're a Christian, for your sake, your circumstances are driving your disposition. You're only as encouraged as it's going. And you're very self-focused every day and don't even realize it. And it becomes all about you and how it's going instead of all about him in you and living through you. And if that doesn't change, how will we ever shine as a light? How will we ever have anything to give if we think we have so much we need? I'm going to say some strong things tonight. I feel it in my heart. Are you all already? I'll smile the whole time. I'll be gentle. I'll be kind. I'll be sweet. No, no, no. Listen, it has nothing to do with what I'm going through. The truth about me isn't found through my circumstances. It's found through Christ. Now I understand why I'm alive. I finally get it. For the last 29 years, I've understood why I'm alive. I understood why now I understand why he's inside me. I'm not waiting for a bell to ring so I can go to heaven. Heaven is on the inside of me. His spirit's on the inside of me. His ways are on the inside of me. Who he is is on the inside of me. So now I can walk in love. I can show mercy. I can make peace. I never again have to take account of a suffered wrong and I can overcome evil with good. I actually became a light. And I'm going to let it shine. No, it's true. I can show you in the Gospel of Matthew where he says, you are the light of the world. Who's the light of the world? You are. Well, I thought you were, Jesus. Yeah, I am, and I'm in you, and I lit you up because he's the light of men, John 1. Now, watch this. You are the light of the world. Nobody lights a lamp and then puts a bushel over it and hides the light, but instead puts it on a lampstand for all to see to light up the room. So therefore, let your light so shine before men. Why? That they see, you really can paraphrase it as this, that they see the way you live. They see your good works. They see your response to life. And guess what they do? They glorify the Father. So you shining a light, walking in an attitude like Christ is evangelistic. Do you know the Bible says that you already ought to all be ready to give an explanation for the hope you have in you. And when people ask you why you're living the way you live, you should be ready to tell them plain why you have this hope. My question is, how many people have run up to us and been baffled and said, how do you live like you live? How many of us Christians have been approached by people inquiring why we carry so much hope? (laughs) Ouch. The Word of God is expecting people to see the difference in our life and actually ask why we live how we live. I can show you two scriptures in the New Testament where a Christian never complains. I can show you in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 3 where it's not scripture to be discouraged. Because it means you're thinking for yourself, not the kingdom. Matthew 6, seek ye, not second, not fourth. Not eight. Seek ye the and his and everything you'll ever need to walk out your life will be added unto you. Ain't that awesome? Now I'm going to be real honest and raw with you. I'm not talking to you because I just met you. But in 29 years, I've met very few people that are living the way I'm talking. But I've met thousands that go to church. Now I barely said that without crying. We got to learn why he died on that cross, people. He did not die on that cross to bless me. He died on that cross to transform me. And the transformation is the blessing. When I'm selfish, I'm very lonely. When I'm selfish, I can't produce a thing. 
And when I say selfish, I don't mean selfish in the raw evil sense of selfish. I just mean thinking for yourself more than you're thinking for his great name. He said, he said, if you're going to come after me, you have to deny yourself. We say, if you die tonight and don't know where you're going, pray this prayer. He said, deny yourself. We say, pray a prayer. We make it about going to heaven. He said, pick up your cross and follow me. We make it about what we get from him. He makes it about what we become because of him. Let's not mix, mess the two up and mix it up. I grew up my whole life with the thought that all the gospel was, was some mysterious move of God on the cross through his son to forgive me of the mess I always am and always will be. To forgive that. And cover that so when I stand before him, the blood will speak on my behalf and I can go to heaven and live forever. That the cross was all about me going to heaven and living forever. It had nothing to do with me dying to my old and living to the new and becoming a changed man. And even when I was told I could be forgiven, I was left in the same state of sin and I still always needed that same forgiveness. I could never change. I'm telling you after 29 years, and you can say I'm a heretic, you can say whatever. I'm going to take my 29 years of experience and stand before him someday. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) I'm telling you, he's here to change our lives. So when you held out your hand and said, change anything in me, I'm saying let's go after motive. Because when I was standing, the first thing I heard the Spirit of God say, talk about their motive. Why are they Christians? Are you a Christian for benefit, for blessing, for protection, for provision? Because if that's what you are a Christian for, you'll have issues with God along the way. You'll be up when everything's going the way you hope, and you'll be down when it ain't working out. You'll even have issues with God and wonder why he isn't answering your prayer and what you're doing wrong in prayer. And why are all these things happening to you? And you won't understand that you're an easy target. Because your motive is permitting things. Self-centeredness brings this stuff upon ourselves. Jesus said, the ruler of this world cometh and he touches me not. Why? Because of his deity? Because of his selflessness? Because he came as a man empowered by the Holy Spirit. He was tempted at all points, yet without sin. So even temptation was there. Things were coming at Jesus like they come to us. He went through everything that we go through, only he went through clean and unfazed, right? And the ruler of this world cometh and has... Nothing in me. Why? Because he works with self-centeredness. He can't touch selflessness. Now, here's what I'm getting to. Go to Genesis 1. You can look there in Genesis 1, verse 26. It said, let us, let us make man in our image, in our own image. Verse 27, what happens one verse later? So God made... Man in his own image, in his own likeness, he made them both male and female. Isn't that amazing, ladies? That your created value in the Bible is to be found in his image. It's not to serve the man. In fact, if we would get scripture straight and look at scripture, you're made with the same exact value and purpose as man is to walk in God's image. In fact, God loves you women so much, he didn't even bring you on the scene in Genesis until man was power-packed with God. Man was naming animals. Man was walking in the authority God gave him. Man had the image and nature of God on the inside, and he said, it ain't good he'd be alone. Why? Because he's lonely? Cut me a break. He ain't lonely. He's filled with God. But he's in the same situation God was before he breathed into the dirt, because before God breathed into the dirt, where does God go with who he is? How does God multiply and manifest the beauty of who he is? Where does he go until he breathes into that dirt and makes a man in his image? He puts who he is in the man so the man could manifest who he is. That's why we have bodies. Image isn't what he looks like. He's a spirit. God is spirit. God doesn't have a head and arms and legs. He had to give Jesus one to come as a man. But God's a spirit. That's why we all look different. 
But we can all look like him. And then we get all caught up in the outward appearance. And life gets driven by what people look like and figures and genetics. And I hate my nose. And how'd I get these ears? And Come on. And we make all the emphasis on the outward instead of that quiet, beautiful, inward person of the heart which is pleasing in the sight of God. And women come under pressure at a very young age and there's a standard set in life. And yet God and image has nothing to do with appearance. It has to do with nature. This whole room looks different. And we can all look just like him. That's what makes us one. That's what makes us family. That's what makes us the body of Christ. And in our differences and in our uniqueness. We can all have the unity of faith. And everyone in this room can wake up in the morning to shine, to walk in the light, and to love like God loves. Or you can wake up for a blessing, for favor, for protection, and you can make it all about you. And then life has a louder voice than truth. And that's why when you ask people how they're doing, they tell you their two biggest trials and say, keep me in prayer. It's a dead giveaway. You've been in this thing a while. When you ask Christians how they're doing, they tell you they're trouble. Because they identify how they're doing with how things are going. So they're always under the rule of life instead of the life giver. Wonder if Jesus answered by how his life was going. How you doing, Jesus? Well, it's a bummer. I preach truth and people call me a liar. I feed their belly and all they want is more food. Nobody wants to really hear what I have to say. I heal all the sick and they say I'm a demon-possessed man. I mean, at least God loves me. I guess you can say that part's cool, but people are crazy and I don't know what to do. Do you get it? Jesus wasn't here to be loved by people. Jesus was here to love people. Why? Because he's loved by God. He's full. He's not needy. He doesn't need love. He doesn't need affirmation. He's affirmed. He's always been with the Father. He knows where he came from. He knows where he's going. He's not here for himself. He's here for us. So you can't hurt that. You can't discourage that. You can't shut that down. That's why love never fails. But now I know us, we've said I love you a thousand times over. But our love has failed over and over and over. Now we're hurt, offended, can't get out of our mind, can't believe you said that. How do I trust again? I can't believe you did that to me. I'm hurt. But when I read my Bible, love takes no account of the... And it never seeks it. And I bet we just don't understand... I bet we're not evil. We just don't understand. We've been trained by a lie, but the truth's come. But if we haven't really heard the truth, we'll still live by the lie. So now feelings matter, motives. Come on, brother, keep it real. How about keep it Christ? No, I get hit with this all the time with people. Well, you got to relate, brother. You got to keep it real. No, I got to keep it Christ. I'm not following us. I'm following him. Not, it's not, yeah, but everybody has their moments. No, no, no. You can't find that in Jesus. I'm not damned to follow that. Everybody has their moments. That's why you have yours, because you have a grid for it. And then when you have it, you have no conviction because you expect it. So there can never be repentance or change. So now you're identified by life instead of the giver of life. And that standard of wisdom is way below the wisdom of God, which is Christ. Come on, I can find you scriptures that say a Christian never complains. All things, Philippians 2, thank you, sir. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. Why? So you can be seen by a twisted world that's living self-centered. That you can be seen by them as harmless, innocent. That means blameless people who are holding forth the word of life because they shine as lights. Ain't that something? Now, that doesn't sound like, yeah, but I hate my job. My boss is really a jerk. It's hard to work for him. 
Well, I need a new job, and I don't know why God hasn't got me one. I thought he's supposed to love me. He's been making me work. I don't know what I did to deserve these last six months, but my job is hell on the earth, and I'm stuck there in the middle. Oh, no, no. I've heard this stuff for 29 years, and it's a dead giveaway that we have no clue why he hung on the cross. We actually think he did it for us instead of his great name to put who he is in us to reveal his glory upon the earth. We got so self-centered with the gospel that we actually think he did that for our sake. And that's why we can be bummed out, angry, give up on prayer, get discouraged, backslide. Because we never truly front slid into the truth. Oh, that's good preaching, ain't it? Come on. Are you all okay? Come on. He said, hold your hand out and let's give up, whatever. I'm just thinking the motive of your Christianity is something that God might want to take a peek at tonight. I don't think we are even convicted when we have a bad attitude because the story behind our attitude justifies the attitude. But if God had the same storyline, then he's not loving us. Sometimes we're so busy being so right that we're way wrong because we're not like him. He said, let us make man in our image, and in the image of God, he made man the next verse. Ladies, you know what he did? He waited to make you. I just love it, ladies. I just think you ladies need a fairer shake than you've been given by the people misinterpret the word. It's like like, like people think the Bible makes you a slave to men or something. No, no, no. Your creative value is exactly the same. You're on the earth to be found in God's image. And I understand Eve was deceived, but Adam committed treason. I understand it says, wives, submit to your own husbands. But it says, as unto the Lord. And then the next four verses are to the husband. And somehow all we hear is wives, submit. And we think submit means bow down and serve. It means yield and adapt yourself. Oh, I did a little word study. It says, wives, yield and adapt yourself to your own husband as you would to the Lord. So there's something God's asking of you challenges you but you stay in prayer you pray your way through and you you lay down you sacrifice you find grace right you're in your relationship you're getting to know your husband more and more because now you're married you're living together every day 24 7 and all of a sudden you find yourself yielding adapting to him little surprises didn't quite see that in him for the first year whatever (laughs) but instead of talking to your girlfriend and saying you know i can't believe i did this he's so this and this and this no 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 Wow, Lord, if he really saw you clear, you know what? He can see you in me. I'm just going to lavish him with love. I'm going to let all this bear up in love. I'm just going to cover him with mercy and with understanding and compassion. I just don't believe he sees and knows the depth and truth of who he is. So I'm going to show him that he's worth being loved. That sure beats complaining to your girlfriend, and now you don't even think you like your husband anymore. Come on, I've watched too much painful stuff in 29 years of pastoring. I've been a pastor 27 in the 29 years. I've seen some stuff that has proved to me, pastor, that we don't understand why God put his son on the cross. And somehow we made it all about us getting something from him instead of becoming something because of him. I'm supposed to be sanctified, set apart in the world, not of the world, no longer conform to the world, transformed by the renewing of my mind. I'm supposed to endure hardship like a good soldier and nobody enlisted in God's army ever again entangles himself in the affairs of this life. I'm supposed to walk in a manner worthy of him and never again fear my adversary. Come on, that's just a few scriptures. I can quote about 20 more if you want me to. But I think that's sufficient. We're supposed to love not our own life unto death. We're supposed to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. How can we love not our own life unto death when we're mad and angry or scared half to death? How do you have authority over something you fear? You see how smart and wise and amazing God is? 
He gets fear out of your life by showing you who he created you to be. So you know you're going to live forever. So it's never about dying. Never. But you're like, I'm never going to die. Like, look, somebody could be so flipped out and angry at me. I just stand up, poof, 44, hit me dead square, boom. I'm never going to die. <laughs> Yay. You ought to get that. Instead of fearing and then finding a scripture that addresses what you fear and calling that prayer, that's just fear with spiritual language. How many people have prayed and prayed and prayed and just never seen anything but? Most of the time, look at the motive of why you're praying. You're praying because of concern, problem, and you need God to change this. And if God would change this, life would be better. And there's all kind of motives behind our prayer that have very little to do with true faith, covenant, or surrendered life and bringing God glory. Amen. There is no authority when you fear. You can't pray for somebody because they bother you. You pray for them because they can't know who they are. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. They can't know who they are or they wouldn't be living the way they're living. That should not offend you. That should break your heart. So we give up on each other. We leave each other. We hate each other. We have three kids together, and now we can't even be in the same room. People, I'm not condemning you. I'm saying we've got to wake up. And even if you've done that three times now, I'm not here to write you off. I'm here to say we got to stop believing that's normal. And at some point, change has to come. Are you all with me? Listen, if you're sitting here divorced three times, you're not condemned by what I'm saying. Be challenged and put on change. And stop just blaming it on everything that doesn't work. Because self-centeredness says, if well, if they wouldn't know well, if they wouldn't know well, if they wouldn't know. You do not see Jesus carrying the cross blaming anyone. And yet everyone was to blame. If he had the mentality we've grown up with, Pastor, he drops the cross. In fact, he doesn't even make it to the cross. But let's just say somehow he makes it to the cross. And now Barabbas happens. That's insulting. No, come on. He's, a, he's in prison. Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior, the Lamb of God. He's here to save and redeem humanity. And he's standing in front of people he created and they knew him not. He's speaking and we're so perverted they can't even hear him. They're so far from the truth that they can't even recognize the truth, so they kill the truth. And he's not offended. He let men hit him. And he did nothing wrong. When you, when you meant right and somebody called you right wrong in life, you freaked out to defend your motive. When you said something and they interpreted it for something you didn't mean, you got 10 times more passionate and 10 times more expressive. I didn't mean that. Oh, you know you meant that. You make me so mad. Every time you say that, you just say that because you know. I wasn't even thinking that. Oh, okay. Am I that far off? And then you freak out to defend yourself. But every time you defend yourself, you give the right for everyone to become your judge. But if you just die to yourself, then you stand before the one that judges righteous. Just think what it would look like if Jesus is carrying the cross and had our mentality. And it's just eating at him. And they're hitting him for doing nothing wrong. He's here because it's the most amazing expression of love the world has ever seen. Is he doing it just so I can be forgiven and go to heaven when I die? Or is he doing it so he can restore me back to why I'm here in the first place and put heaven back inside of me? Is he doing it so I can have relationship with the Father? We call eternal life a destiny. Jesus called it knowing the Father. That's relational. Jesus never made his motive heaven. You can't even find any scripture where he's making the motive heaven. It's always back to the Father. We've made the whole motive heaven because it suits us. People are becoming Christians so they don't go to hell. And then they wonder why their life is still a living hell. 
Oh, no, I've been around us 29 years. And I'm passionate. I want to save people and snatch them out of these lies because I don't think it's because we're evil. I think it's because we haven't understood. I'm going to nutshell this thing for you. What time is it? Five of eight. Are we? Oh, oh, I'll worry about it a little bit. No, you don't want to tell me not to worry about it, sir. (laughs) I know that sounds spiritual, but that is the wrong thing to say to me. (laughs) It's the wrong thing to say. It's the wrong thing, isn't it? Yeah, thank you, Eric. <laughs> let's, let's do this this way. So God makes man in his image, both male and female. So when he sees man in the image of God functioning, he looks at all the animals. They all have a somebody comparable, right? They can all multiply and reproduce after their own kind. Where's man going to go with the glory of who he is? There's, nowhere to, there's no avenue for multiplication. So what's he do? That's where you all come in, women. You ain't a second thought. You ain't here to fill the gap of Adam's deficiency. And you're not here to scratch his itch. You're here to be loved by God through him. And bring seed forth to the earth after its own kind. Because that law is already on the earth. So he says, let's make man in our image, both male and female. He tells Adam, don't treat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you treat the tree is the day you surely die. So we all know the story. But let me get, just finish this thought with the women. He doesn't make another lump of clay when he makes women. He reaches into the fullness of God in the man. And he takes what was one and makes it two. So two could be one. And then he says, go ahead and be fruitful and multiply. We think sex. (laughs) He's thinking image. Oh, what's the whole context? Image. The whole context of the chapter is image. Each seed after some kind. So he makes man in his image. And when he sees man functioning in his image, naming all the animals and authority, he's not upstaging him. He's not chuckling. He's not saying, you can't call it that, Adam. That's silly. <laughs> Whatever Adam said, so it was. And at that point, he said, whoa, ain't good this man be alone because he has nowhere to express the glory of who he is. Nowhere to multiply. So he brings forth the woman so the two can be one and multiply the image till the whole earth is filled with his glory. We've turned it into needy. She's hot. He's a hunk. Wow, she likes me. Oh, my goodness. He wants to be with me. We've made it weird. I've said this for 29 years. If there's a woman in a man's life, according to Scripture, it ought to be because of the fullness of God in the man. Not because he's needy and has needs and she's vulnerable. Because most of the time we say, I love you. It's an emotional expression of needs being met. And what we're saying is, I need you. This is working. Don't jump ship on me. Don't break my heart. My life is finally working. Don't mess this up. And instead of saying that, we say, I love you. And it feels good. But we're on the thinnest ice we've ever been on. Because as much as they're making us in a moment, they could absolutely shatter our whole world. Because we're saying it for us. How's that for being real? So if God made man for his image and God isn't a head, arms, and legs, then what'd God make man for? God made man to love. Because God is So the image of God, if it isn't facial features and torso and body and arm, then what is the image of God? It's who he is, not what he looks like. And God is love. Now watch this. So man was made to love, not need love. What happened? The day Adam ate the tree is the day he surely died. Did he eat the tree? Did he fall over dead? But God said, the day you eat the tree is the day you surely die. He didn't fall over dead. Well, God doesn't lie. Something had to die. What died? We all say spirit is spirit. Well, we don't know what that means. It just sounds spiritual. (laughs) Yeah, people always say, well, his spirit died. No, no. The nature, the image died. 
Who he was created to be was lost through sin. Why? Because he got separated from God because of sin and got cut off from the source of love and now became in need of love. So Adam didn't just sin. He took on the nature of God's enemy and started to multiply the fruit of the enemy instead of the nature of Father God. To the degree that when Jesus came and was the truth and stood before his own and nothing was made that wasn't made through him, yet he came to his own and his own knew him not. And he wept with compassion, not frustration. Because they were sheep without a shepherd. And he's the good shepherd. And he was here to lead the flock. And guess what they did? Killed him. He raises from the dead. And his blood is still speaking better things. He's still saying I love you. I want to live in you. I want to redeem you. I want to restore you. Here's the truth. The day Adam ate the tree is the day he surely died. The image was lost and all the purpose of why man was here seemingly was lost. But not with God. Only with man. So now every man, Romans 5, you know this, Pastor. Every man since that day was born into Adam. That means every man was born into no identity. Everyone in this room knows exactly what I'm talking about. I don't care how young or how old you are. You know this. From the time you can remember, you needed attention. You needed valued. You needed support. You needed to feel appreciated. You needed to feel like you mattered. Why? Because the identity of man got lost through sin and man got separated from God and death entered inside him. So every person in this room was born into the need to be loved instead of fulfilled and expressing love. So everyone in this room at a very young age, found an identity through your story, what unfolded, how it happened. That's why everybody's constantly talking about their past. Because that's the only place they ever found any sense of who they are. Through their story. But the truth of who they are is in his story. That's why you have to forget what lies behind. That's why you have to put off the old. And put on the new. It's not about how it was when you were growing up. It's about how it is now that he's inside you. It's not that your daddy never said, I love you. My my, my dad just passed on January like 21st. I've never heard out of my dad's lips in 81 years, I love you. I do not have a deficit. He had a deficit. He didn't know how to express. He didn't know how. We had some good spiritual moments. and, And I believe my dad did right and made right with God. I really do. I am not a hurting young man in a 62-year-old's body. Hello? I don't need prayer. And it's not some unanswered dream and prayer that I never heard my dad say, I love you. Are you kidding? I heard the father say, I love you. (laughs) Matthew 23, 9 says, call no man on earth your father. That doesn't mean you're sinning on Father's Day if you send your dad a card. What it means is don't limit, identify, or regulate your life through natural biological means because you have one father and he goes back to the beginning. And he's from heaven. So it's only through him that I find me. Watch, I can never find me through you. If I try to find me through you, I'm always at the mercy of you. And I'm only as good as you're doing me. And if you're not doing me good, then you become my reason for why I am whatever I am. And it's this vicious, lying cycle of lost identity in people that mean well, but don't understand. And then you start taking it personal, and then you start thinking you're just not valuable. If you had more value, people would recognize it and treat you different. And if people keep doing this to you, you must be of low worth. And next thing you know, you see yourself low, so you live up to low. You know what I see? I see everybody in this room worth the death of Jesus and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I see everybody in this room worth the resurrection of Christ Jesus Yeah, that's what I see. That's why I'm here. That's why I have passion in me. That's why I drove four and a half hours to get a mic and talk about this stuff. 
and say, let's stop hurting each other. Let's stop arguing and tension and the need to be right. And let's die to everything we've ever been so we can live to everything he desires to be inside of us. And this ain't perfection. This is just purity. And the pure in heart shall see God. Yeah? Come on. If he made man to love, what are we all doing staying trapped in the need of it? Waking up for a spouse to love us. Waking up to be loved by somebody. Waking up for somebody to say something nice. Living for attention. Living for accolade. Living for the moment. Come on, that is a prison at best. Every man on the earth was born into Adam. And you must be. Born again, and somehow we tragically turn that into a prayer that takes me to heaven instead of restores the truth about my life. And we have just told people to try to get to heaven instead of get back to him to see who you are so you can manifest him all the days of your life. What else does deny yourself mean? What else does pick up your cross mean? What else does love not your own life mean? How can I love not my own life unto death and be offended at you? How can I walk in a love that never fails and doesn't seek its own and keeps no record of wrong and have an issue with you? Be real with me. But because the person was wrong, that makes us right? No. When we step out of love, we step out of him. So what do you want to be, right or like him? Come on. We say we want to be like him, but when the rubber meets the road... Do you or do you want to be right? I've been in rooms this size, plenty of rooms, and preach on becoming love. And you know what? I found a whole lot of people, when it comes right down to it, don't really want to give up and and become love. They hold on to the thing they inherited through the fall instead of the thing they were created for by God. I can show you so many scriptures. Romans 8, the middle of the chapter, says we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Who he predestined, he called. Who he called, he justified. Who he justified, he glorified. What shall we say to these things? If he be for us, who can be against us? For if God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not freely give us all things through that same son? All things what? Full vats and barns? To be conformed to him. I can show you 2 Peter 1. We have exceedingly great and precious promises by which through them we partake of his divine nature. Watch. Having escaped out of darkness into light. Having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. He's not talking about pornography. He's talking about self-centered desire. (laughs) Sounds like it's impossible to be a Christian, a little Christ-like one. Without denying yourself. I guess anybody can go to church. But who's a little Christ like one? I'm not being mean. I'm being real. You can go to church for 50 years. Serve in every ministry available. And be a class A attendant. Get thrown into crisis. And respond like the man that never went to church. When you squeeze an orange. What do you get? See you said orange juice. You didn't say juice. You said orange juice. Why? Squeezed an orange. So if you said apple, I'd look at you funny. Because you don't squeeze an orange and get apple, do you? That would be strange. Agreed? Why isn't it strange, sir, when you squeeze a Christian and get everything but Christ? Man, that should be weird. I wonder if the enemies learn just to squeeze them and put the pressure on. Because you know what? They're not surrendered. They don't really understand why they're a Christian. They'll just get mad at God and wonder where he's been and why he's slack. And he ain't good. Look what he put me through. And all of a sudden, it'll even be God's fault. I don't even want to pray anymore. You don't know the hell I've been through. Don't tell me God's good. If he was good, I wouldn't have had a car wreck and laid off. My kids running wild all in the same week. As if God's responsible for man's decisions. And now we've painted some kind of picture about God like he's our busboy, our servant, our genie in a bottle. And he's in position to make our world work. 
No, he brought us into his world, and we're key players to manifest the glory of who he is. He said to Ezekiel, you know, my people got dispersed among the nations, and everywhere they went, no matter where they went, they profaned and misrepresented my name, but I'm going to bring them all back. I'm going to put a new heart in them. I'm going to put a new spirit in them. He said, I ain't going to do it for their sake. I'm going to do it for my great name. Why? So the whole earth can be filled with his glory. Look, I understand people do us wrong. I understand people do wrong. But if you get betrayed and live betrayed, then you don't understand what I'm preaching. Jesus was betrayed every day. Could you picture Jesus dropping the cross? Halfway to Golgotha and just saying, what am I doing? Am I a fool? Look what I've let these men do to me. They released Barabbas, God. I know I'm here and I'm the lamb slain before, but enough is enough. I mean, where do we draw the line? I mean, come on, Barabbas, he killed a man. I raised the dead. He's causing conspiracy. I'm trying to bring peace here, and they want to release him and kill me? Are you kidding me? If these people didn't change by now, they ain't never going to change. I ain't taking one more step. Well, that's straight, ain't it? We'd all understand that if it was us. It sounds silly because it's him. Because we know him better. But we were made for his image. And the things he does will do if we believe. So why isn't it silly when we talk like that? Because we've been trained by a lie. And we've been homeschooled in the wrong home. And the wisdom of the world has taught every man how to fend for himself. And Jesus said, you will never follow me if you don't deny that one right yourself. We don't preach the gospel that way. We say, if you die tonight and don't know where you're going, pray this prayer. I'm not against men praying a prayer to get saved. I'm against not giving them the truth. Of why they're getting saved. You can't just say pray this prayer. So you can go to heaven. He has to become Lord. And you die to everything you've ever been. So who he is can live in you. No this is the truth. We're the lights in the world people. We can't get through the week. How are we going to impact the world? If we can't get past our obstinate relative. If we're dreading thanksgiving. Be real. You know why we're all chuckling? Because it's not far from the truth. And then our prayers are, God, I hope she doesn't show up. And God, I hope he's different. Instead of help me to see them through your eyes so I can be a living epistle and example of your love. Come on. See, I don't ever wake up for my wife to love me. Makes my marriage amazing. 29 years. She's not, she, couldn't, she couldn't bring me into animosity. Because I see this thing now, Eric. I understand why I'm alive. Mercy gave me another day to be more like him. I don't wake up for her to love me. I wake up to be like him. That changes the game. I wake up to shine. That's why all these years, people that have known me all these years, I'm this aggressive all these years. I'm probably worse than I ever was because I know more than I knew then. If you ever see me again, I might be a little worse. Because I might know him just a little bit more. But what a free day that is when you wake up and nobody owes you a thing. And your identity is established in Christ and nobody can take anything from you. They can only cheer you on. That's why I've been aggressively okay for a long time. (laughs) And it's not because I've been done right. And who's keeping a record anyway? Because love keeps no record. Are you with me? God made man for his image, his image is love. The whole goal of the Christian life is becoming love, not going to heaven. The cross is not paid in full when a man prays a prayer to go to heaven. It's when his nature is restored back to love. That's when the dividends of the cross are revealed to God. What does it matter if people's names are in a book called life and they're not walking in love? And they're not shining as lights. And they have adversity and animosity in the own body. In the only ha- own house of God. How are we impacting the world if we can't even love one another? 
Jesus said, when they become one like we're one, then the world will know. Church attendance will never change the world. Becoming love will. Church attendance is designed to stay stirred up in love and good works. We have to be careful we don't get so good at doing church we fail to be her. Christianity is not a church attendance. Christianity is Christ-likeness. I'm not saying for a second not to attend church. Church is a proving, sharpening, testing ground. It's a community. It's iron sharpens iron. This is important. You should never forsake it, the Bible says. Why? So we stay stirred in the right direction. Are you with me? So I hope we were serious when we asked God to go after anything he wanted. Because when pastor had us do that, I went, oh, man, what a prayer. And as soon as he did, I heard motive. And I heard to talk about our motive. You have to ask yourself tonight, why am I a Christian? Am I a Christian because it's right? Because I should be? Because I'm scared? Because I don't want to go to hell? Because I want God to bless, protect, and provide? Or am I a Christian so his life lives in me? And this light gets lit and stays lit. And whether I'm done right or whether I'm done wrong, you're going to see him. Because love covers a multitude of sin. Mercy triumphs over what men deserve. And love doesn't seek its own and therefore it never fails. And the greatest of these is 1 Timothy 1.5 says this. The goal of our instruction or the end of the commandment, the purpose of the commandment is love. People, I'm convinced of this after years and years of preaching. I say it emphatically with cameras running, not afraid of how people criticize me. If we fail to become love, we fail to miss the whole point of why Jesus died on the cross. It's a restoration back to his image. I can show you Colossians 3. Why don't you look there quick so somebody that says he didn't even open his Bible won't won't be able to say that. There's always somebody that notices he never opened his Bible. Well, if you were listening, I preached three quarters of it and quoted it. I quoted it a little bit, a little bit. So I think we were legal anyway. But for that person that needs that practical visual. (laughs) Colossians 3, please. (laughs) And if you're taking a while to find it, you shouldn't be worrying about me not opening my Bible. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. You know, there there was this lady and man, that new pastor came to their church. Where's the where's the new pastor? Where's Joshua fell at? Where's he at? Who's the Joshua fellow I met tonight? Is it Josh? Jordan. Jordan. It's you. I thought that was you. Okay, I had the name wrong. It was Jordan. I met a lot of people. New pastor. Raised up, a couple invites you over, you're the new pastor, bring you over. They get their best stuff out. Silverware, silverware. Not just shiny silver colored wear, silverware. <laughs> pastor comes over, they serve this nice dinner, they're chatting, talking. Pastor gets up, look, I got to be going, thanks for your hospitality, see you on the Sunday. Leaves, she's cleaning up and goes, his spoon's missing. Pastor took the spoon. Silver price is up. And pastor, you know, new probation salary. (laughs) He took my silver spoon. So she can't get this out of her head. She says to the husband, pastor took the spoon. Oh, you're crazy. No, I'm telling you, he had the dessert. I had the spoon right there. I cleaned up. There's a spoon missing and it was at his place. So she don't have the nerve to ask him, but she's thinking he took the spoon. A year goes by. She don't get this out of her head. Her husband says, hey, we ought to have pastor over again. She's thinking, I'll be missing a fork, you know. But he talks her into it, and she says, okay, but she can't take it. Pastor comes in the house, and she says, pastor, I need to talk to you privately. I have to settle something I've been harboring for a whole year. When you were here the last time, I had a fork, a knife, and a spoon. We ended with dessert. When I cleaned the table, 
your spoon was missing. (laughs) Did you take my silver spoon last year? He said, oh, no, I put it in your Bible. (laughs) (laughs) Oops. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. You just didn't know where that was going, did you? (laughs) For a whole year. (laughs) Poor old Bible. (laughs) Just sitting there unloved. (laughs) What a wise pastor. (laughs) That way he doesn't ever have to ask from the pulpit. Are you guys reading your Bible? (laughs) Just put a spoon in there and find out. Why'd we even go there? (laughs) If you don't fill your heart with the word, and the word is truth, how will you ever discern a lie? How will your mind ever get renewed and transformed and be never again conformed to the world, but transformed by the renewing of your... The renewing means thinking like you've never thought before. The only way that's going to happen is to put brand new thoughts, a brand new way. Amen? So don't read the word because it's the Christian thing to do. Read the word because you want to know him. You want to understand and see and have his wisdom. Amen? Did I turn you to Colossians 3? I'm going to read it, not like when pastor saw me preach and I gave him a text and never went to it. I did that. I know I did that. I do that all the time. I have a strong reputation for turning people to Scripture and then maybe even sometimes an hour later start to read it. I had a person say, oh, uh, Pastor, before you came, I told my people, a pastor told me, he said, when he says turn to Scripture, whatever, don't be in a hurry. Wait 40, 45 minutes. Just pay attention to everything he's saying so you don't miss anything. In about 45 minutes, go there and he'll maybe get there about but I never even made it that, that day. I believe you, sir. I do colors in my Bible. What's the most color you see there? It's a, well, it's actually it's a purple. But I can tell I can see why you would think it's pink. But it's it's a purple. It's a colored pencil, but it's purple. But it's predominantly the the the, the main color you see, right? I'm old-fashioned. I know you guys have technology you can hit, and it'll all do it on the computer for you. I just like to sit down with pens and read and do my coloring. I just that way. To do the whole New Testament in purple, I mean, to do the whole New Testament, it takes me about three, two and two-thirds of a purple pencil. I barely go through one on any other color. But purple, I go through close to three pencils just to do what is purple. Christian conduct commandment the way Christians are called to live the whole New Testament is full of Christian living so if I was just praying a prayer to go to heaven why is there two and two thirds colored pencils worth of commandments and Christian living and conduct in my Bible you get it this thing is about the life we live because that's what men see That's the the greatest tool of evangelism you'll ever have is living Christ, not talking about him. Parents, listen carefully. This is not condemning. It's just sobering. It's not condemning. If you take your children to church, some people get pregnant. They don't even go to church, but when they become a mother, they get this instinct like, my baby needs to grow up in church. Who's ever heard that? Who's felt that way in here? You're You're like, okay, I have children now. I need to get to church and be more diligent and get my kids to church so they can grow up in church. That's what we feel. Watch this. If, if what you do is take your children to church because it's the right thing to do, but you're not pursuing Christ outside of church, you're sending your children a message without even realizing it that Christianity is church attendance, not Christ-likeness. And then you're teaching them the way it is at home is reality, but at least we go to church. But this is real life. But it ain't Jesus' life. 
You want your children to see Christ. And if you've not done a job modeling that, don't you be condemned at these words. Just go, oops, and start now. And get convicted and pray that into your life. It's not about failing. It's about becoming. I wonder if our children need to see humility and repentance and change. I wonder if our children would be benefited by it and say, you've really been different in the last. I remember, Daddy, when, well, Daddy had some real turnaround. Let me talk to you about it. Remember how we used to just go to church? I didn't have it. And then all of a sudden, you can impart a truth that's backed by your life. That was brought up by your child because they see it. (laughs) That sounds powerful. That's how I've evangelized my children and my family. My wife went into identity crisis for eight years. She compared herself to me. She believed people said hi to her because she was my wife, not because they cared about her. And she had some insecurities and some needs that she wasn't letting the gospel heal. And she went into this dark place of introversion and, and condemnation. And the more she pulled away, the easier it was to stay in there, even though it was torment. And people would call her to check on her. And she'd say, they're only calling me because I'm so messed up. I had no connection with her. I'm preaching on identity. I'm pastoring. I'm full time. And she won't even come to church towards the end. I'm not a man with a problem when that's happening. My wife's in trouble. Even if I knew this pastor, I'm not calling him saying, pastor, we need a breakthrough. If God doesn't change her soon, I can't hold on much longer. I got so much on my plate. I mean, a guy can only hold on so long, right, Pastor? I mean, I've been doing my best, but I'm about ready to break here. And if God don't change her soon, God doesn't change her because I'm ready to break. God changes her because he loves her. And there's no time for me to break when I'm walking in Christ. Because I'm not waking up for her to love me. (laughs) You get it? So what she need most? Jesus. Where's he live? So now ain't the time to be a frustrated husband. Oh, relationships are. It's called love. You see how powerful marriage is? It's called I love you. Not I need you. You're cutting me short. Come on, it's convicting. I was pastoring. Both my children ran wild at the same time my wife was doing. It looked like I couldn't even be a steward of my home. It looked like I had no clue. It looked like my home was blown up, man. My kids were both running wild at the same time because they saw what mom was going through. They said to me, is our mom crazy? Do we have a cuckoo for a mom? I said, pray for your mom. Don't criticize her. And they both ran off in their flesh and tested out their flesh. And everybody took an eight-year sabbatical from truth, except for dad. Why? Because I woke up every day to be like him. And one day, I felt a little sorry for myself. I sat in the bed. I said, you know, I feel like I can't even hug my own kids. The Lord didn't even hesitate. He said, so hug everybody else's. (laughs) He didn't even give me a chance to get sentimental. (laughs) Come on. So hug everybody else's. I can't even hardly preach this stuff in an American church. Watch what he said. And don't think for a second your neighbor's children have less value than yours. They're all the same to me. (laughs) You know how we feel sorry for ourselves, And all it is is need. We need our kids to want us. We need our kids to love us. And we find our identity and value even through our children. Instead of see our highest priority is to manifest Christ to our children. Not need them. Manifest Christ. That's the highest sense of love. So what do you do? You don't waver. So when my child comes back, and both my children, my wife, my family is solid. Everybody's solid today. Solid. Yeah, my son's preaching in Georgia right now. My daughter's married to a great Christian guy. My wife, you would want her to pray for you. She's as sensitive and loving and compassionate as anyone I know. And there was a season for eight years where she didn't even want to live because of lies. And if I'm needy, I buy into the lie. Next thing you know, well, I can't live like this forever. Well, Jesus might have waited for you longer than eight years. (laughs) 
Whew. You see the boldness of my speech? I got all these things to back it up. I'm not preaching anything I haven't lived full force. My son comes home from years of drug addiction. I haven't seen him since who knows when. And he's on the run. Guess whose door he knocked on? Mine. <laughs> There's a reason. That story of the prodigal son, we always call it the prodigal son in the subtitle. It should be godly father. Because without the father in the story, there's no ending. It's just a regretful boy that blew everything. Without the father, the father's what makes the story. So when my son knocks on the door, guess who I have the privilege of being? The father. And guess what he can see through me? The first love of God. Because nobody loves God first. They see his first Wonder if you're the first love for people. Wonder if you're God's first love. Wonder if you love people so unconditionally that they're face to face with who he is because of your life. Now, I have two people in my life that experienced that, my wife and my son. And I might have more, but I am totally aware of my wife and my son have been loved by God through me to where they saw his love and realized it was him. And now they love him. That's different than you need to get back to God. You need to serve the Lord. <laughs> he knocked on the door and the rest was history. God just changed him. This warmth came over me. I looked at him and I smiled and said, hey, buddy. Oh, my goodness. It's so good to see you. That sure beats where in the blank have you been? And what? You just knocking on the door out of the blue. You just leave. No communication. You don't talk for all this time. And you just want to show up and knock on the door. What are you even thinking? Do you know what you've done to your mother? That's how people talk on the front porch. Because they're venting their feelings and unresolved conflicts. I wonder if you don't have any. I wonder if you're sincere when you say you don't wake up to be loved. But you wake up to love. And when that boy knocks on the door, he already knows he's wrong. You know what happened, Pastor? Holy Spirit, you know how he gets involved. He's something else, ain't he? Oh, man, he's my friend. Guess what I said to my son? I said, son, look at me. Do you understand that I'm not one bit angry at you or discouraged or disappointed with you? It was the question he needed me to ask, because guess what he said? Dad, that can't be true. Meaning at this point, after all I've done, there's no way that can be true at this point. I can't believe that. And I looked at him puzzled and said, I don't. See how you can't believe that. We didn't have you, so you live your life for us. You don't owe me a thing, son. If I cry one tear ever, it's because you're so much more than what you're living. It's so good to see you. And he's staring me in the eyes and realizes he can't see disappointment. <laughs> and it wrecked him. Because he knew it should be there. And guess what he said to his mama, who's my wife? I had to clarify that because that's not always the case. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he said, Mom, I got so loved by God, dad, by God through Dad, I'll never be the same. He said, Mom, I've heard Dad preach this stuff my whole life. But I gave him every reason to be something else. And Mom... He doesn't know anything else. <laughs> you want that testimony. Because guess what that did for him? Saved his life. You get it? So now it ain't just theory and precept and theology. In a young man's mind, he gave me every reason to be something else. And all he found in me is what he's heard me preach all this time. So he wrote me a handwritten letter two years later and said, Dad, I want to thank you for giving me the best gift a dad could ever give his son. You showed me what Jesus looks like in a man in every situation. I know what mom, me, and sis put you in the middle of. And Dad, you never changed. Thank you for the greatest gift. 
That sure beats being hurt, feeling sorry for yourself. What did I do wrong? Where did I go wrong as a parent? Willful, stinking, selfish children. I don't see any life in that arena. I ain't never seen anybody having the time of their life at a self-centered, sorrowful party. When you feel sorry for yourself, it's the loneliest party you've ever been to. At best, you get two people to join in and agree with how you feel, and you call them your support system. (laughs) Ouch. (laughs) They're your temporary friends. I got to close. Colossians 3 would be good. <laughs> Let me try to read this. This is going to be dangerous, but I, can, I think we can do this. It's not that terrible, terrible late, right? I mean, I drove four and a half hours. You ought to let me preach that long. I never pulled that one before. That sounds awesome. I drove four and a half hours, guys. I should be able to preach at least as long as I drove. I was just in California, so they were three hours behind. So I started the service. It was 10 o'clock to my body. So at 9 o'clock, I said, are you guys all right? And they said, yeah. I said, you realize it's 12 o'clock to me. I'm East Coast. I've been up since 3 in the morning, and it's 12 o'clock to my body. So I'm three hours ahead of you guys. You have no excuse. you got three hours to catch me, and then I'll be three hours ahead. (laughs) I do it to them every time I go to California. And then I get all fired up and I say, and you can see how I'm wearing down and how run down and tired I'm getting. And they're like, ah! <laughs> Let's do this. Let's try to read this. I, I would love to teach this out, but I think it'll, it'll speak so loud on its own. So whoever made Christianity about praying a prayer to go to heaven, we probably ought to say, let's just look at some of these scriptures, right? The goal was transformation and change. Please, please, please hear what I cried out in the beginning. If you're a Christian, I already know you're not having a great time. You're very self-conscious, circumstance-driven, and praying about your circumstances changing. Instead of praying for Christ to manifest through you in every moment. A lot of us have a need list this long. And some of those needs are wants. What a want is... Is if your need dictates your disposition, it crosses a line. Now it's idolatry. Because it's mattering more than what matters most. So if what I'm going through dictates my output, my disposition, I got things crossed up. If all I am is a broken man, when my kids are running wild and my wife won't come to church. Eight years, disconnected emotionally, this one stumbles people, and physically. My wife was not functioning for eight years in an emotional capacity as a wife or a physical capacity as a wife. And I was 37, 8. Eight years. People go, eight years? Why do you let time change truth? When truth is what makes you free. To know the love of Christ is to be filled with all the fullness of God. I am not a lacking man. And my wife is not on the earth to scratch some itch I have. My wife is on the earth so I can love her with the Christ that's in me. Not demand of her and need her and put expectations on her. But actually value her and love her like Christ loves the church. I found all that in my Bible, Pastor. Back to Colossians. <laughs> since, you, since you were all raised with Christ, that word if means since. He's not challenging your salvation. He's not saying if you're saved. He's saying if or since you were all raised with Christ. Now watch this. See this, we did not pray a prayer to go to heaven. Watch this. Seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. So he hits that twice in two verses. Not the things of the earth. Why? For you died. Uh Uh-oh. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
And when Christ, who is our life, appears, we're going to appear with him in glory. Nobody ever taught me this growing up. Nobody ever preached this from a pulpit. Nobody ever told me that Jesus died on the cross to put his life in me, to transform me, and to get me back to what he intended me to be. Man was never made for himself. Man was made for God's image. Yeah? And it's totally, look, if you put metal in a microwave, does that work? What will you do to the microwave? Woo-hoo. Do you ever do it by accident? You ever leave foil or a fork on a plate and hit the button and wow? And if you keep putting metal in a microwave, what would you do to the microwave? You blow it up. You would literally burn it up and blow it up. Why? The way that thing scientifically works in the waves, it just doesn't work with metal. Read the manufacturer's handbook. You do not put metal in the microwave. Manufacturer's handbook on life. Read it. The manufacturer says the product was never made to live for itself. And the only way you can go to Jesus is deny yourself. Not pray a prayer to go to heaven. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. And now you're following. He didn't say sing to me and pray to me when you're overwhelmed. He said follow me. And he would never invite you in if you couldn't follow through the power of Holy Spirit. We have not preached this gospel. We have preached a gospel to serve us instead of transform us. And we have left a lot of people with broken promises that God never made. And forgive us from the pulpit for not making it clear. Because on Sunday there will be countless messages that cater to the listener and keep him encouraged to keep listening. Instead of challenge his heart to make him more like Christ. I don't need to be right. I need to be like him. I don't need you to treat me right. I need to be like him. Yeah? So when Christ, who is our life, appears, we're going to appear with him in glory. Therefore, because this is true, put to death. Don't moderate, balance, self-control. Put to death. Let me put it this way. Kill your life as you know it. Put to death your members which are on the earth. Remember I've mentioned that itch a few times. First thing on every list, sexual desire, fornication, uncleanness. It's not that it's not real and can't be holy. It's just most of the time self-centered. It's all about what you get out of the experience. It has nothing to do with the holiness of God and love and communion and covenant and oneness. It has to do with feelings and satisfaction and gratification come on you can't tell me that one night stands are normal even in the church they happen all the time i found that they happen a lot in the church you're not having a one night stand for them come on Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness. It's all idolatry. The simple definition for idolatry is making something matter more than what matters most. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming to the sons of disobedience. That means those who continue to live this way without any thought of changing, right? Why don't you look down on them? Because you and me lived this way at one point when we acted this way. So that should produce humility in us. Nobody's exempt. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all needed mercy. We've all needed forgiveness. We've all needed the blood of Jesus. There's no hot shot. There's no low life. There's just a bunch of people that need God's mercy. And because we have tamed mercy, we should be merciful. Because we've been forgiven, we should be forgiving. Because we've been loved, man, we ought to love. Right? So... We lived this way at one point, but now you yourselves, you yourselves, this isn't an order call. It's not some kind of deliverance. Watch this. You yourselves are to put off these things, not control them. The world calls it anger management program. Control your anger. That should be hypocrisy to the church. 
So we're working hand in hand. There's some things that just rub me wrong about this guy, you know, in time. Oh, but I am so disciplined and mature. Rather than give him a piece of my little mind, I harness it. Because I'm mature. And I manage it. But when I look at you, it's there, buddy. <laughs> but I'm so good at it, he doesn't even know it's there. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Yeah, that is hypocrisy. That's hypocrisy. Yeah. Yeah. Anger management should be hypocrisy and alarming to the church. It means I feel a certain way towards you. I just don't express it because I'm mature. What do you do? Manage it or put it off? Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. How do I do that without running the risk of getting trapped in a list and risking failing? That's a good question. I get alone in prayer and I realize God never made me for those things. They're all hinged in the wellspring of self-centeredness. The perverted motive of sexual desire, wrath, anger, malice, it's all self-centered stuff. It all works through self-centeredness. The craziness of our emotions comes from self-centeredness. People say God gave us emotions. No, Adam gave you the emotions you grew up with. God didn't give you the emotions you grew up with. In fact, the purpose of faith, 1 Peter 1, I can show you, the purpose of faith, the consummation of faith is the salvation of your soul, the redemption and soteria of your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, because that's what took the biggest hit right here, because everything comes out of self-centeredness. So if we deny ourselves, everything changes. So we put off the old and put on the... Nobody had to teach you to be angry. You were angry before you could speak. You'd be playing with a toddler and you'd be, before even English, the toddler, you're playing and nobody even sees this truck until one of them touches it. And as soon as the toddler touches it, the other toddler has to have it. And now there's a tugging match, a screaming match, pull tug, poof. They didn't have to learn that. It's all part of the package called the fall of man. They, they want to take their sippy cup to bed. No, sippy cup. No, honey, it'll leak. It, it, it just, it's not going to work, honey. You don't need to take it to bed. I want my sippy cup. Take the sippy cup. Ah! They did not practice that. You did not have to stay up late and crash the books to relate to discouragement, jealousy, pride. It all flows through the wellspring of self-centeredness. And every man was born into Adam, and we must be born again. That means we die to everything we've been and understand we were never made that way. We became that way. So you know how a preacher will say, this gospel will cost you everything. All it'll cost you is giving up what you were never created to be. You just give up the lie so you can walk in the truth. So I take this list to prayer. And I realized I was never made for that list. I was made for his glory. And in prayer, I put it off. And I'm sincere. And I don't want to live in anger. I don't want to look at men through self-centered eyes. God, I thank you that I see what you see. That I live from your heart. Father, I thank you no one owes me a thing. God, I thank you even my wife is on the earth. For me to love her as a husband the same way you love your church. God, thank you. And you're just in prayer. And you're putting off. And you're putting on. Why? Because you are what you are by the grace of. So as I put my faith in the truth, grace comes to make truth my reality. And now my wife is six years into that deception and time has nothing to do with it. Why? I've been formed in Christ in prayer. Holy Spirit has a hold of me. I've crossed the line of no return. I see for the first time in my life. You get it? Seven years in doesn't change a thing. We're not on a time clock. You get it? People go, eight years. A day is a thousand. A thousand is a day. Not a thousand days, a thousand years. A day is like a thousand years. A thousand years like a day. There's no time with truth. Heaven and earth is going to fade away. But my word, he said, I didn't come to judge you in John 12. He said, I came that you might be saved. But 
but you will have my word that will judge you in that day. Probably ought to live by his word, not our feelings. Not rightness in the wisdom of our neighbor. Don't lie to one another, verse 9. Why? Because you've put off the old man. Wait, I didn't put off. I just, the pastor just said if I die tonight, I don't know where I'm going to pray. No, you put off the old man and his deeds. And look what you've done in verse 10. Look who the new man is. You've put on the who? New man. Who's he? Renewed in knowledge according to the... uh Uh-oh, what? He's renewed in knowledge according to what? Of him who created him? Let us make man in our... Guess what got lost through the fall of man? The image of God in man. Guess what Jesus came to restore? The image of God in man. We've made it a passport to heaven. He makes it a transformation of nature. That's why you put off the old and put on the new. Ain't that something? In the image of him who... What's Second Corinthians say? Beholding is in a mirror. The glory of the Lord and being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. We need any more bearing witness scriptures? Jesus said, when you see me, you see the. And he told us to follow him and the things he does will do. Which means when people see us, they're supposed to see the. Why? Because he brought us back to the father. Do you guys understand that Isaiah 42 or 52 makes it real clear that Jesus was beat beyond description. That when they were done flogging and beating Jesus, he was marred more than any of the sons of men. You can't miss this stuff in your Bible or it'll just be an Easter story to you and a suffering savior instead of a radical truth that's life changing. Marred more than any of the sons of men. How barbaric have people been and sadistic to people? Have they set people on fire? Have they burned people on poles? Okay. In the Christian day, they'd call them Christian candles. They, true story, they would soak them with oil and then light their toes. Now, you tell me when the fire goes out, if you can tell if that's Billy, Joan, Henry, or Nancy. You couldn't tell their gender, let alone who they were. Agreed? He was marred more than any of the sons of men. Do you agree that people have done things to people that left them unrecognizable? And then Jesus was marred even more. Why? Why wasn't it just 39 stripes and some stakes in the hand and feet? Why was he beat beyond description and made unrecognizable? Because when sin got done with Adam in the garden, he didn't look anything like he was created to be. He lost his appearance. So Jesus came and lost his appearance to parallel and pay the price for us to get back the image. Nobody ever taught me that at VBS. They just taught me to be a good boy and gave me the idea that I wasn't going to be. And try not to sin too much, but we all sin. And gave me this lame understanding and this crisscrossed identity that even if my heart wanted to change, I had no power to change. Boy, I got the power to change now, baby. (laughs) Why? Because I can wrap faith around truth and grace comes to make it mine. Yeah? And I am what I am by the... So guess who gets all the glory? And there's no super Christian. Just people that believe. So who gets all the glory? You get it? Don't lie to one another because you put off the old man in his deeds and you put on the new man who's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is in all, is all and in all. Now watch this. Therefore, as the elect of God, isn't that amazing? 
holy and beloved. People are like, ain't nothing holy about me. You've been made holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight if you believe it. The blood of Jesus has washed you and cleansed you of all unrighteousness and forgiven you of all sin. So you've been washed clean and made to stand in the presence of God as if you've never sinned and you're not guilty. And yet people live guilty, have a hard time getting in the presence of God, have their face veiled when it should be unveiled, and with boldness come to the throne of grace. Not arrogance, not presumption, confidence. Why? Because while we were yet sinners, he sent his son. He made him who knew no sin to be sin. He didn't curse his son on the cross. He cursed sin in the flesh. And sin shall have no dominion over us. For the law of the spirit of life through Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. We are not filthy and dirty and condemned. We are justified and righteous and holy in his sight. Paul wrote, holy and beloved. Most people, well, I don't know if God loves me. I don't feel loved. You are loved. The cross says so. You're not waiting to feel love. Believe love. Are you with me? What would it look like if every day we woke up clean? Just woke up clean and believed we were clean. As a man thinketh, so he Whew, If you could change a person's value and identity, you'll change his life. He'll live up to what he sees and believes. If he believes he's a son, his life will look like sonship. If he believes he's justified and forgiven, righteousness will produce its fruit to holiness. Now he's walking in holiness and he ain't even trying. So it's not works. It's not Christian discipline. It's the just shall live by. We can hardly even talk about this stuff without red flags. And yeah, but everybody's going to sin. Everybody's sinning. You're freaking me out. You're sounding like you're perfect. I'm not talking about perfect. I'm talking about pure. And if we're afraid, how do you reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God in Christ? It's in Romans 6.11. Reckon yourself dead indeed to sin but alive unto God in Christ. How can I reckon myself dead to sin if I feel like I have to keep boasting in my ability to commit it and call that humility? We're being deceived. We're wearing an identity that he paid to get off of us. 1 Peter 1, I'll give you scripture after scripture, or two. It says, he bore your sin and my sin in his body on a tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, and by his stripes we are healed. You know how many people are living condemned and feel guilty, still responsible for their past, but their hearts changed. They're sorry they did what they did, but they're still wearing the identity of what they did instead of putting on Christ and being washed clean. How many people say, you made your bed, sleep in it. You, you get out of that bed. He made you a bed. Well, if I were you, I wouldn't get my hopes up. Get your hopes sky high. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Well, what you see is what you get. Don't you ever live by what you see. It's subject to change. The things unseen are eternal. Do you see that we grew up with a language that he ain't speaking? Wow. I preached about four, five, seven, twelve messages. I don't preach. Did you notice I don't preach messages? I just go crazy. I don't even preach messages. Can you see I wasn't prepared for this? <laughs> Can you see I'm way off my notes? <laughs> Can you see I filled my heart with the word? That I'm possessed by the word? <sighs> you ought to be. My sheep hear and obey. My voice. He didn't say. He said in a stranger's voice. You will not. He didn't say you won't hear it. My sheep. When you know you belong. His voice is crystal clear. And the enemy's is strange. When you're not sure you belong. The enemy sounds rational. And all of a sudden you're believing lies. And you're still sitting on your past. And you still feel unworthy. And you're still taking responsibility for something you've been sorry for for five years. My sheep hear and obey my voice. And the strangers, they won't follow. He didn't say you won't hear it. You'll hear it often actually. Recollection, memory, flashbacks, familiarity. 
Just driving in your car feeling good and some gray, nasty thought and yesterday memory comes. You ought to lift your voice and rejoice that you're clean. That God has put something new in you. Instead of feeling defiled and call for prayer and ask for forgiveness for something that's not in your heart anymore. That's 13th sermon. Holy and elect. Elect and holy and beloved. Guess what you're going to put on? Because you just put off all this other list. Guess what you're putting on? Now we're going to put on his image. Because now he's going to. Didn't he break down the flesh? Now he's going to break down the image. Guess what you're going to put on? Tender mercies. This is in prayer, people. This is where you put off. Everybody owes you something. The right to be right. and The need to be right. You put all that off. Nobody owes you a thing. One of the greatest things you can take to prayer is, Father, teach me what it means that nobody owes me a thing. I'm complete in you. I'm full in you. Nobody owes me a thing. Listen, if, if, if I was living for you to love me, I'm only as good as you're loving me. If I needed you to find me, I only find what you give me. And if you're doing me right, I'm doing good for now. But if you change your mind about me, now I'm insecure. And I'm only as good as you're doing me. It's not the truth. That's only if you're needy. That's only if you're insecure and your identity isn't healthy. That's why so many people live insecure and with a low esteem. Every addictive behavior, and there's plenty of them in the church. Every addictive behavior is attached to a low esteem and a crushed identity and value. And we think we got to get free from an addictive spirit. You just got to see who you are. And if you see the value of who you are, that thing will break. The only reason a man is trapped in pornography is because he doesn't know the value of his life, so he can't see the value of their lives. So he's exploiting their lives to feed something temporal in his life because he doesn't know the truth about who he is. And then the people involved in his life take his addiction personal and take it and think they're not. And it's all identity crisis leading to more identity crisis. And each seed after its own kind. Where does it ever end when somebody draws the line in Christ? Yeah, come on. I came and preached strong to you tonight. Yeah, he gave me his pulpit. I better preach the gospel. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Come on, bear with one another. <laughs> Forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, doesn't say file it. Even as Christ already forgave you, so you go ahead and forgive. But above all these things, what are you going to put on? Why? It's the bond of perfection. Isn't that something? What a gospel. I guess I said all that to take us right back to square one. Please make sure you don't get tricked into being a Christian for you. Or just what God can do for you. Don't be in your own little soap opera. And this is saga 10 of season 12. The days of your life. No, let that be dead already. It's the days of his life in you. Your circumstances should have nothing to do. When you understand what I'm preaching, should have nothing to do with how you're doing or who you are. No individual should have the power to dictate your identity but Jesus. If you're trying to find yourself through someone, you're at the mercy of that someone. And you will never live complete. And your I love you can never be sincere. It's always reduced to I need you. And then when we fall out, it proves we don't understand love. Ain't that something? It's all scripture. I didn't say anything. It's, it's all scripture. He says when there's schisms among you, when there's confrontation, he said you're just living carnal. Which means it should never be. See, we're not, we're saying, yeah, but everybody, stop, but everybody, we're not following everybody, we're following him. We sing, he's the Lord, let him be the ruler of our life. Amen. Not past practice, we're not following the crowd, we're following him. And I ain't never seen none of that in him, so I don't want to see it in me. 
And if I can't fit what I'm thinking into him, then I got to get it out of what I'm thinking. Are you with me tonight? I'm going to pray something real simple. I'm not having an altar call. I'm just praying something simple over you. But I'm asking you to be sincere. You make peace with God tonight. Hey, if you haven't been living anything I'm preaching, don't be like, oh my gosh, I got a long way to go. No, you got somewhere to go. Don't you leave here heavy and think, oh, this was too much. I don't even know if I'm saved. (laughs) Nope, just go, duh. Oops. Man, I didn't see it like that before, but he sure backed it up with a whole, whole, whole lot of word. And Jesus' life and his own personal examples. Duh. And just say, you know what, Lord, the best I'm hearing him and the best I understand, I'm stepping in. And I don't want anybody to owe me a thing because I want to be more like you. And I want to walk in sincere love and I want my life to be an epistle. I'm not being self-righteous when I say this. I have actually had a whole lot of people in public, airports, etc., walk up to me and ask what it is about me. That's why my speech is confident and bold. What is it about you? What? I hope I don't sound weird, but I feel so drawn to you. Like there's something about you. Like I saw you talk to that man. I couldn't get my eyes off you. There's just, what is it about the way you carry yourself or something? And I'm always ready to give an explanation for the hope they see in me. I've actually had it happen quite a bit. (laughs) But I'm like this in the airport. I'm not like, oh, here we go again, another weekend. Stuck in the middle seat, probably won't even have room for my bag. (laughs) Somebody has to sit in the middle. Why can't it ever be you? (laughs) You just got people on both sides to talk to. (laughs) If he's sleeping, try to get her awake, you know? (laughs) It's just fun. Life is fun in Jesus. Now, if I'm carrying issues, I won't see the people. So I gave up my life subscription to issues when I got saved. I canceled my subscription to issues. So I don't have issues. I seek ye first. Kingdom of God and life is a gift, not a grind. You know why life feels like a grind? People are living it outside of why they're here. Why would God empower you to travel a road you were never created to be on? No wonder it feels dry. And if you're drinking out of dry cups, you're thirsty. Why don't you come and drink from a well that never runs dry? And just one drink. He said, if you'd ask, I'll give you one drink. And just one drink, you'll never thirst again. You see what's wrong with me? (laughs) I said, okay. Identity for the rest of my life. Secure. Settled. Full. Cup running over. That's why I look energetic to you. I'm not drained because I've been preaching long. You aren't drawing it out of me. You're splashing in my saucer. (laughs) You couldn't even reach my cup. (laughs) You're down here flopping in my dish. Because he said he'll fill the thirsty and flood the dry ground. So if there's anything dry in you, there's enough here to get wet. But it's not costing me. That's why you don't surround me on the weekends. Or He's poured out so much, Lord, and emptied himself. Please fill him up. I'm not going dry. (laughs) If you're drinking out of my cup, I'm going dry. You're not even reaching my cup. I'm not here because of ministry. I'm here because of Jesus. You get it? It's different. If I was doing ministry, I'd probably get weary. If I'm living Christ, I'm set for life. Y'all good? There's a way. I I love to pray for the sick. Oh, it's 10 after 9, though. Are we too late to pray for the sick? You guys good? Well, you know why we got to pray for the sick? Because I just preached on forgiveness of sins. The reason... We believe and should have faith for the sick to be healed isn't just because they're sick and God's good. It's because of the forgiveness of sins. And the forgiveness of sins is part of redemption. 
So if man sinned and death entered the earth. And because all men sinned, all men die. Jesus took away what? Sins. So then the repercussions of sin should be challenged. That's why when we recognize premature death and things like that or death because of sickness, we actually have authority to pray for the sick and pray for the dead. There's a young man I paid his way and sponsored him to go to a boot camp school, evangelistic mission school. He went and he ended up staying, him and his family, his wife and children. And now he's a leader there and they just went on a mission trip to Africa. And I just found this out. A demonic man that would bury himself in the dirt. He'd dig a hole and bury himself in the dirt. And then he'd come out of the dirt. And people just didn't even know what to do with this man. He would just do crazy things. He came to the service. And when this friend of mine was lifting his voice and praying, the demoniac got completely set free and came to sound mind. Came up and said, I don't know what happened, but I had this pain. And I felt like what has been tormenting me is gone. And everybody's just freaking out. There's a lady there. It's in Africa, brought her dead baby and was just standing there with her dead baby who's been dead for like two days. And everybody's just praying and he's lifting his voice and praying, Holy Spirit, come. And the baby wakes up in her arms. My friend experienced it. I said, man, I want that. Like, I want I want to be there. I want that. See, there's so much unbelief in our lives that when you tell stories like that, I'm not saying that to be mean to you guys. What I'm saying is unbelief is more prevalent than faith. That we have a hard time believing stories when we hear them because it didn't happen in front of us or we didn't see it happen when we prayed. But just because you didn't experience it doesn't mean somebody isn't. And uh, this just happened this past weekend. And it was just cool because just to see God growing in his life and he's there and it's authority and he's praying and it's synergistic and it's corporate and he's praying and this little baby wakes up. Well, how do you even measure that? Like that's just, yeah. He can do it. We were singing that song, right? So the reason we pray for the sick and should have faith for the sick to be healed is because of the forgiveness of sin. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You have to understand that when Paul explains in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, being ambassadors, and he says Jesus was here reconciling the world to God by not imputing their trespasses. Meaning the fact that he was here in the flesh was a sign of God's mercy, not judgment. And that everybody he was praying for and that came to him was getting healed. Why? God wasn't seeing them for their sin. He was seeing them through his son for their creative value and purpose. So he wasn't imputing their trespasses. So they were clean in that way. So they weren't guilty. Daniel's in the lion's den. The king said, oh, oh, Daniel, was God able to shut the mouths of the lions? He said, oh, yes, O king. For as much as he found me innocent in his sight, he shut the mouth of every lion. What are you through the blood of Jesus? Innocent, if you'll believe that. Now, a lot of people believe guilt, condemnation, shame, memories, flashbacks, old dreams. But you probably ought to believe the blood of Jesus first. And once for all. So that's what gives me faith to pray for the sick is God's mercy. Because now we're those same ambassadors as if we're pleading, be reconciled to God. So whatever city we're in, heal the sick there and tell them the kingdom of God is at hand. That's Luke 10. Matthew 10 says, go preach. The kingdom of God is here and then heal the sick. Cleanse the leper, cast out devils, raise the dead. Yeah? Yeah? Or raise the dead and cast out devils. So in Matthew 10, you preach and you heal. In Luke 10, you heal and you preach. Why? If you're going to show, tell. If you're going to tell, show. But it's because of the mercy of God that triumphs over judgment. And it's ultimately the forgiveness of sin. So the blood of Jesus is speaking better things. Now, do people still have to repent and get right with God? Absolutely. But we can see them for their creative value, not the error of their ways. Because we judge no man any longer according to the flesh. You get it? Okay. Yeah, that is good. So let's pray for the sick. Here's what we're going to do. It's... Just going to take a little bit of time because I want to get you all involved, all right? Uh, not crazy long, but it'll take a little bit of time. You all good? It'd be worth it if a bunch of folks get healed, right? Yeah. There ain't much we can do to stop that because Jesus is here and it's a little too late. The train's rolling. <laughs> He's so good. Jesus is so good. All right. So when you pray for the sick, now listen, we're going to do this little thing and I'm going to get you all involved and don't be afraid. And if you're afraid, I really want you to get involved. 
Because this is a safer environment you'll ever be in. And I'm even going to teach you and help you and show you how to pray. Nobody can go wrong unless you don't participate. The only way you can mess up is if you don't get involved. I'm going to make it sure of it that if you get involved, there's no way to mess up. That's how easy we're going to make this. Why are we going to do it this way? I even asked the worship team, if I go this direction, don't, do you notice how they didn't come up? I told them, don't come up because I don't want background and help and atmosphere. They're too good anyway. They'll make it easy for us. I want you guys to be so conscious of praying for the sick that tonight for some of you might be a real start and a breakthrough, but continue to pray for the sick. If we start praying for the sick in our city, in our town, in our malls, in our shoppings, in our gas stations, on our workplaces, wouldn't this be amazing? Wouldn't we start to be doing a Luke 10? Whatever city we're in, heal the sick there. So a lot of times, I always thought people didn't pray for the sick in their life because they weren't theologically in agreement with healing, but I found that it's a different reason most of the time. You know why I found people won't pray for the sick in their personal life? Because they're afraid nothing will happen. Or they've stepped out and didn't see anything happen, so they backed off. But yet when I open my Bible, it still tells me to lay hands on the sick. And it tells me to never turn faith into a point in time or a hit, miss, win, or lose, or 30-day money-back guarantee, try me 60 days, see if you like me. Actually, the Bible just says believe. And it says, if I, I believe, I'm going to lay hands on the, and the sick shall. So it used to eat me up when I'd pray for people in the streets. I'd pray for people in the streets, and I'd see people healed. And I'd be like, yeah, that's easy. When they, when they say, oh, my gosh, that's like, whoa. But then you get them ones, you pray for them, and they're like, no, it still hurts pretty good. And you're like, <laughs> and you're snorting and grunting. And I found that it don't matter how much snorting and grunting and how many sounds I make, that ain't what heals them. So you can't take that personal, and you can't get discouraged, and you can't get a, uh, you can't get a like, oh, for one, or a four and six, or a seven and five. You just got to pray for the sick. If I pray for 16 people that die of cancer, the Bible still tells me to pray for the sick. You just don't tell them you're oh, for 16. It doesn't help. <laughs> just pray. And sometimes when you're oh, for 16 and praying, you know what you're doing? you got every reason not to believe, and that's sometimes where you find true faith because you're not going to be talked out of it. Here's what I'm telling you. After tonight, be more sensitive and conscious to pray for people everywhere you are and everywhere you go. The reason I don't have music is because it doesn't always feel all that spiritual when it's just you and the person and your nerves, and they're just being kind and going, okay. And there's not a whole lot of ooh there in super spiritual atmosphere. So tonight, I'm going to try to make the room as dry as I can. I am. It's a little opposite than what we usually go for. But you watch and see what happens because Jesus isn't dry. <laughs> He's really wet. Yeah. He's living water. So what I want to teach you tonight is the atmosphere is the kingdom of God that's in you. It's not how you feel. It's what you believe. Now watch this. Who's ever prayed for the sick in this room? Just let me see. Okay, that's good. That's a lot. Now watch. You'll know. You'll chuckle when I say this. When you pray for the sick, did you learn what we do? As soon as you go to pray for the sick, you know what happens to most of us? We get self-conscious and we get focused on our prayer and we try to pray right, powerful, and anointed. And we think it's our prayer that heals the sick and we're trying to pray the right way. Who knows that's what we do? Can I tell you something good? I got good news for you. Your prayer never has, never will heal the sick. It's not your prayer. It's his finished work. It's faith in him and his love for people. Now, none of us have a problem believing that God loves the person you're praying for. We all, we all would agree theologically that God loves people. Right? We get self-conscious. We try to pray right. We don't feel anointed. We're preaching stuff like, well, you see the river flowing in somebody. You need to get to the river. You need to touch the hem of that garment. And then we're making it like people, you know, are walking in it more than others. We're all called to be believers, and the signs follow those that. So that can be the room. Scripturally, that's supposed to be the room. Is that correct, scripturally? Okay. So tonight we're going to do that. When you pray for the sick, there's two things you'll run into, a lot of different sicknesses. But you'll run into people that if they were healed, they wouldn't know they're healed because there's no symptoms to tell if they're healed other than faith in their heart. Like it's internal, it comes and goes. It's a migraine, they don't have one now. They just got a, a, a scan back and it's a woman and she, they found something on a cervix or on her, you know, somewhere inside her womanly area, but she didn't know it was there until the x-ray. You know what I mean? 
There's stuff that if people were healed, it's internal, it's in your blood, it's something, but you don't really know it. There's no symptom to check. That's no easier to pray for. It takes the same sincerity, same faith, same finished work. Then there's symptoms. A lot of us would like to just pray for the stuff that we wouldn't even be able to know. It's like, oh, let's just pray. You're going to be fine. Yay. (laughs) But we'll shy away from somebody paralyzed. We'll shy away from stuff that has visuals. It's both the same faith. It's not your prayer that heals the sick. It's faith in him, his finished work, and his love for people. Watch this. Be whole in Jesus' name is plenty when it's backed with a revelation. Are you hearing me? And any of us can sincerely believe that and pray that and not get overwhelmed and try to pray right or be afraid to pray wrong. Are you with me? Let's do this real quick because of time. If you're here tonight, and please don't not participate. Please, please, please. That's God's going to do things and move. I was just in a church last week, and I had people hold out on me. Now, don't you hold out tonight, because I don't know if we'll be that gracious, even though God is super gracious. But I had people hold out on me, and I said, just stand to your feet. And they, there was people that didn't stand. So I got like three, four different specific words of knowledge for people, and then they jumped up. I said, now listen, don't you start saying, if he calls out my thing, I'll get up. No, you should have already been up. But, but there was a couple people that were hesitant for some reason, And it was so funny because I walked over to the corner of the platform and the rows were real close. And I said, I said, okay, guys, we're finally ready to pray. And I got over here and I went, oh, my goodness. I said, I don't know why you're not up yet. I said, your left hip and this lady right here. I mean, I could have almost touched her. She went, oh, my gosh. And she just stood up. I said, I smelled it. I smelled it. And we were all just getting silly. I looked over at my buddy Todd. I said, I smelled the hip. He went, oh, my gosh. We were just having fun. I don't know why she sat all that time, but she jumped up. Don't do that tonight. Just jump up. First group, if you have something in your body, but you would not know if you were healed because it's not symptoms, you would just have to be in faith and time will tell, a test will tell, or just time, or I, I have to go to work. Once I do my job for two hours, I'll know, or sleep tonight, I'll know in the morning. You know what I'm saying? If you have something like that going on in your body, but there'd be no way to tangibly tell except for faith in your heart you're healed, please stand to your feet so we can pray for you quickly but effectively. Just stand to your feet. We're going to do this super quick but, but sincere. Stand to your feet if you have a condition like I'm talking about. And you wouldn't know if you were healed because there's nothing to check tangibly. Please, please, please jump to your feet quick. I'll know when we're ready. And, and, and I'm, we got plenty of people to pray for and it's late. But we'll pray when I know we got everybody up that needs to be up because it's real. So don't make us wait. Just jump to your feet, please. Thank you. People keep standing up as I'm waiting and pleading. Why would I plead like this when we have all these people already? Because it's real. And he wants you standing because I'm telling you these things are changing. It's just fun. Anybody else need to stand? I'm feeling like I got about two people that need to jump up yet. For some reason, you didn't stand yet. Thank you. Thank you. Good. I like when you say two and two jump. (laughs) Thank you. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. This thing is real. It's why I'm waiting. Thank you. If you're sitting near them, just tap them, get a hand, do a finger lock. Don't smother them. Just be gracious and just say, hey, I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to believe for you. Don't pray yet. Just acknowledge them. And say, hey, I'm going to pray for you. If you're sitting right by somebody, just say, hey, I'm going to believe for you. It's going to be real simple. We're going to do this simple. Okay, if you stood up for prayer, listen carefully. This is all I want you to do. I want you to believe this tonight and believe it for the rest of your life. Father, I know you love me. Watch. I know you love me. Or you'd have never sent your son. Come on. You settle that in your heart tonight. The measuring stick of God loving you is not your circumstances. It's not sickness or no sickness. It's not how people are treating you. The measuring stick of God loving you is Christ crucified. And we know God's love in this, that he sent his only son. Yeah? So faith works through love, and we're rooted and grounded in love. So important. Now we're never moved by life or circumstances. Why? Because I'm already founded in love. So I am valuable to God, and he loves me. And he gave the life of his son up. To redeem me and give me life. Ain't that something? So say that in your heart tonight and believe that for the rest of your life. Fair enough? 
touch your person and just say this. We're not even asking them what they stood for. I just don't believe right now it's necessary. Just say, be made whole in Jesus' name. No more symptoms, no more sickness, no more weakness. Completely whole in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for your great love. Amen? Amen. That's great. Thank you. No, that's good. It seems simple, but it wasn't simple. Jesus paid his life to make that possible. What's simple is that we don't have to get into works and feel like this isn't something we can't walk in. It's called faith. Amen. You can all sit down. You can all sit down. So do, do this church a favor and, and the people that prayed for you tonight. Not me. You don't even have to let me know. I just, God is doing so much. When you realize you're healed, I don't know what that means. I don't know if that's through the night. Uh, so I have an idea. Some people stood up that they'll know after a night's sleep. They'll even know in the morning. There's some people that'll just take a couple days of time to know. When you know and realize your body's changed, Tell this church, tell some leaders, say, I stood up on Friday and somebody I didn't even know just touched me and prayed sincerely over me and I believe God loved me and man, that thing's going. And just cheer people on in the fruit of what God does in these simple exercises because they're more than exercises. They're training and equipping times, amen? It's not me lining everybody up. My gifting is fun. If you sit beside me on a plane, you'll probably get my gifting. I don't look for my gifting on a platform. You know why? Because everybody's looking for gifting and we go bonkers over gifting. We ought to go bonkers over a believer priesthood and that we can walk in Christ and live by the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. So here's what we're going to do. If you have sickness in your body tonight and you would know you're healed, first of all, is there anybody that it's very hard to stand or you can't stand and you'd rather be sitting for us to pray for you because it's a challenge to stand, but you would like us to pray? I need to know who you are out of sensitivity just so we can pray for you. Is there anybody have a hard time standing? You, You want prayer? Okay. And right here, okay, oh yeah, yeah, okay, sleeping, okay, so there's a little girl sleeping, but do you want prayer, the man in the blue, anybody else, because I saw some walkers and chairs and different things, and I don't know who's here, that it's just easier to sit sometimes, but you want prayer, but it's hard to stand because of backs, legs, knees, everybody else good, okay, here's what I need you to do, if you have some in your life less than wholeness, and it would be amazing if we, you were healed, right? And if you were healed without exaggeration, no music, no hype, you would be able to sincerely check your body. It's not physical therapy. You're not taking your prayer person saying, lift it higher. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's not like that. Your body will tell you. Grace, you'll know. I want you to check. And, but you have something in your body. It's physical. And if you were healed, your body would, would tell you. You would know. I need you to stand to your feet, please. Don't stay sitting. Please get prayer tonight. It's not a lack of faith if you stand up. You say, I'm already in faith. Okay, let us be in faith with you. Come on. It says, is any among you sick? Let them ask. You're not, you're not claiming sickness when you stand up. You're saying, there's something in my life less than wholeness. I'm believing God wants to heal me. So stand to your feet, please. If you have something in your body less than wholeness, stand to your feet, please. Are we waiting on anybody? Are we waiting on anybody? Please stand if you need to stand. Okay, I'm going to go with that. I'm just going to believe we got here. Thank you. Okay, here's what I need you to do. Lift one hand real high so we don't lose you in a crowd. Okay, now the people sitting, listen carefully. If you're nervous, I'm excited about that because you ain't going to be self-confident. If you're scared, get on my team. Get on Team Jesus. The people sitting are my prayer team. I'm going to tell you what to pray. You can't mess up. You say, how can we do this? We don't even know who each other is. We don't even even equipped. We're all equipped to just believe Jesus. I'm going to keep it so simple. Nobody can go wrong, Pastor, okay? You're going to trust me on that one, right? Okay, because we don't know everybody, but watch this. This is a sanctified room, man. We're praying in the name of Jesus. I'm going to give instructions how to pray, and you watch and see what Jesus does in this room. The people sitting, go claim somebody. If your hand's up, when they get you, put your hand down. Don't pray yet. Don't even pray yet. We're going to do that together. Just meet them. Just say, hey, I'm going to stand with you. Come on, everybody sitting, get up and find somebody, please. If you're nervous, please get up. Because if you're nervous here, you'll never pray in a parking lot. But if you get up and challenge that nervousness here, you might be inspired to pray in the parking lot. 
And you might wonder, man, I could have been doing this my whole life, right? That's what happened to me when I started praying for people out in public. I have parked my car along the road and tracked people down because I have been doing this for a while. Anybody else need somebody to stand with them? Only, only put your hand up if you're waiting for a person. You still need a person? Okay, I got a lady waiting over here. Anybody else waiting on somebody? We covered, oh, over here, are you good? Are you doubling? Oh, yeah, we got a lady. Is there somebody who can pray for her? Thank you, my man. Where? Oh, I got one more. I need one. Can I have somebody else? Thank you. Atta girl. Yeah, they were doubled up over here. She said, I can go. Okay, here's what I want you to do. Don't pray yet. Just take three or so seconds. Tell the person that's going to pray for you why you stood up. Just give them that simple three-second version of what you're believing for. Just arthritis. I got the symptoms. I got bone on bone. I got scoliosis, you know. Just give them the three-second version. Just tell them what it is. Okay? Y'all good? Everybody should have that. You good? Y'all know? Here's why I did that. Matthew 17. They prayed for an epileptic boy, so the whole context of the chapter is sickness. They prayed for an epileptic boy, but nothing changed in the boy. So when Jesus came, the Father said, I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't cure him. And, and Jesus said, your faith is perverse generation. Bring the boy to me. He heals the boy. They said, why couldn't we do it? He said, because you're unbelief. But truly, I tell you this. See, we get all taken back by the unbelief part. But truly, I tell you this. If you have faith as a mustard seed, what will you do? You will say to the mountain, what? Move. And what will the mountain do? And nothing will be impossible for you. He doesn't say God. He says you. So when we took three seconds to tell, what are we saying? This is the mountain. This is the, the obstacle. So what are we supposed to say? We're supposed to tell that thing to move. So if they told you, I have a herniated disc or scoliosis, I have arthritis symptoms, watch this. Arthritis, you completely leave, all pain go in Jesus' name. Scoliosis come out of the spine completely straight with no more pain in Jesus' name. Who knows? You're speaking to the mountain. You can be sincere, believe God's love for the person, and never get self-conscious in prayer. You're not trying to get a move of God. You're not trying to move heaven. Heaven already moved. You're releasing what's here by simple faith. Watch this. Watch this. Knees be completely restored with no more pain in Jesus' name. Who knows you can do that and be sincere and be less than five seconds? When you pray for people in the streets, don't you pray long. They're already being nice most of the time. And you stand in there and praying for two minutes and forgetting what you're praying for. <laughs> Just pray for the thing, right? That's why we did the three-second prayer or the three-second thing. So you know the mountain. Are you all good? Now, who believes in this room that Jesus loves the person you're praying for. We all can believe that, can't we? So then we just believe that the finished work is enough and it's his love, it's not our prayer. It's not even because we've lived worthy, he's made us worthy. And we believe and we facilitate in that love. That's what we're doing when we're praying in faith. Do you get it? So that's why these signs shall follow those that they will lay their, why their hands? Because God's saying, when you lay your hands, I'm laying mine. Ain't that something? That sounds pretty cool. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do that. I'll give you five to six seconds to pray. That's really quick. At about six seconds. That way nobody can get in trouble. Who stepped out just being obedient and you're actually nervous and you were a little nervous about doing this, but you're praying for somebody? Be honest. Who was, who was nervous? Okay. Wow. Good. Honest people. I so wanted you on my team. Yes. Thank you. Who knows they're not relying on their own ingenuity? Yeah. So I got a bunch of people that joined in. See, this is fun. When we pray, I'm going to say, okay, guys, wrap it up. That simply means bring it to a close in the name of Jesus. Arthritis you leave, every pain you go in Jesus' name, right? Knees you be restored, total mobility in Jesus' name. So when I say wrap it up, it just means finish speaking to the mountain in Jesus' name. Got it? 
And then what I want you to do is the same thing the first group did. Father, I know you love me. You never sent your son. Settle that for the rest of your life. So after we pray, I'll be coaching a little bit and giving instruction. But I want everybody, listen, without exaggeration, testing and checking your bodies. I don't want you looking at the little girl that prayed for you thinking, I can't tell her I'm not okay. <laughs> and then you say, I'm fine, honey. Ah. <laughs> listen, and nobody's getting a new partner. <laughs> you're, you're stuck with your partner. <laughs> I'm having so much fun. <laughs> no, we do all this stuff. We're like, whoo. That boy touched her and she got healed. I want him to pray for me. Your person is plenty because Jesus is plenty. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. Now watch. Pay close attention. I'm teaching. There's a lot of teaching here. We're going to check our bodies without exaggeration. When you know you're healed, when you come to the place where you know and you go, oh my goodness, I don't, it's not there. You raise... Two weeks ago, I saw a man fell off a scaffolding, 35 years, been crippled. Stood in a standing position, bent over and tied his shoes for the first time in 35 years with no pain or obstruction. 35 years, that's a Bible story. A guy prayed for him that never prayed for the sick. Prayed for five seconds and 35 years of injury disappeared. (laughs) Pretty cool, huh? Do you think that guy's going to be inspired to pray for a few more people? When you know you're healed, I need you to go like this and let me know you're healed. And you just celebrate that and be thankful. If you're somewhat healed and you know you're better, but you're not 100%, just tell your person as soon as you check your body, say, hey, I'm 60% better for sure. Just thank God for that and pray the same five-second thing you believed the first time. You say, well, why do I have to pray again? Jesus prayed for a blind man. He said, what do you see? He said, I see men as trees. He said, let's pray again. He prayed again. He said, what do you see? He said, whoa, I see men as they are. Okay? So we're just going to pray again. Now, here's the one we don't talk about much. If you get prayed for and nothing changes and your body seems the same, do not jump ship. Do not say, oh, I knew I should have never stood up. Every time I stand up, I never get healed. I don't know why I got tricked into this. I should have never let that man trick me to stand up. (laughs) Must be something wrong with me. I'm never healed. Something's blocking my healing. You can't tell me something. But yeah, that's blocking your healing right there. (laughs) Shut all that down. Just shut all that down and stop becoming your experience. And stay a loved person of God. Tell your person, no, everything seems the same as it was. I sure appreciate you believing with me. And then that person just pray another five seconds over. By that time, we'll start taking a couple testimonies. When we take a testimony, the people that didn't receive anything at the time in their body, pay attention, listen to the testimonies, be thankful that God's healing, throw away all that. Well, how come he didn't heal me? Thank him. He's a healer that he loves us and he's doing a work in you too. And every time you listen to that testimony, you check your body again in thankfulness and watch and see what happens in bodies in this room. I call it popcorn in a bag. (laughs) Somebody will get healed and sometimes it's like this even slow movement. Sometimes it's crazy fast movement. Last week it was crazy fast. The week before it was seemingly slow, but all of a sudden the popcorn started popping in the bag. And next thing you know, now you got five hands up. Now you got eight hands up. Now you got people back here squealing. Now you got a lady crying. And as they're listening to testimonies, being thankful and not changing their minds, healing just keeps coming in the room. Wouldn't that be pretty cool? So let's stay in faith and never change our mind. That's what faith is. And that's what Christians do. They believe. Amen? We're not trying tonight. We're believing. That he loves that person and he paid the price. Y'all ready? You didn't forget what you're praying for, did you? (laughs) Because I do talk a long time. Y'all ready? Jesus really loves the person you're praying for. You ought to look at him like that, like he really loves him. You ready? Five to six seconds. Speak to the mountain in Jesus' name. Go. Give him the kingdom.
Okay, that's definitely six seconds. That's good. Just start to wrap that up. No, that's amazing. Just start to wrap that up in Jesus' name. Thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you in Jesus' name. Father, I know you love me. You'd have never sent your son. In Jesus' name. Wrap your prayer up. Everybody should be finished by now. Okay, people we prayed for, just check your bodies. Start checking your bodies all over the room. I don't want exaggeration. Check your bodies. If you know you're healed, go like this so I can see you in the crowd. You know already? For sure? That quick? Wow, that's quick. That's good. You know for sure? Wow. You couldn't do that? We'll talk about it in a minute. That's cool. You knew immediately. (laughs) Anybody else? You too? You're healed for sure. Instantly. That's quick. That's good. That's good. This is movement. Back in the back. Yeah. Well, just for my sake, go like this so I can find you. It's hard to see. You're healed. You're healed for sure. You are for sure. Guys, this is pretty cool. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You are for sure, for sure. Man, thank you, Jesus. We're going to get a couple testimonies in a minute. You can put your hand down. I know you're there. The only hands I need up now is if you're just finding out. You're just finding out. You're just finding out, and you're healed. Check your bodies. We got a bunch of things happening. Let me ask you this question. Who didn't raise their hand, but they know they're better? They're somewhat healed. They're just not all the way, so they didn't raise their hand. Let me see how many people that is. Wow, that's a good bunch of people too. Just tell your person and pray five more seconds and then check your body. And if you get all the way, go like this for me. Are you healed all the way? No? Okay. Somewhat. Somewhat? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All the way? Did you just find out? Did it just happen? So it didn't happen all the way till just now. Oh, that's so good. Guys, she just, her body just went all the way healed just now. So do you see how if we change our belief because of experience or time, that might not happen. But if you keep believing the same thing, bang. Ain't that cool? Anybody else finding out they're healed? Anybody? Let me see. Anybody? We're going to take a couple testimonies. Are you healed in the back? Yeah? Did you just find out that it just happened? That's beautiful. Who else? Did I see another hand? Did you just raise yours? Is that why you're crying? I like that. Because you know it's your body, right? Yeah? So this is pretty good. Like, you know you're healed. Did it just happen? Yeah? And you were checking, and it was a little better? Now it's completely. Oh, that's so good, girl. You're healed in the back? Ah, you, you look healed. <laughs> Radiant back there. Hey, this is fun. Anybody else? I'm just taking my... You know you're healed? Did you just go all the way healed that last time we prayed or partially? You feel completely healed. Seems like it. You're right up on it. <laughs> Amen. No, that's amazing. Okay. Testimonies. Let me take a couple quick. If, you, if nothing changed yet in your body, please don't jump ship. A Christian only ever has one response. Thank you, Lord, for loving me, and thanks for what you're doing in me, right? Well, let's do a testimony. Sir, you got healed pretty quick right here in the front. You said you couldn't do that? You weren't able to do that? Show me what you could do before they prayed. What was your max? Okay, so, like, how far could you have went without it biting you, like, about there, and then it would grab? And then you'd have had to consciously push your way through pain and stuff. Throw it up there for me. Nothing wrong. I don't know about you guys, but that's fun. Thank you, Jesus. Who else? Who's got a testimony? How about the lady that was crying back there? Hey, can I get the lady that was weeping? Can you tell me what happened? Can you tell us what happened? Yeah. Okay, so this was more of an emotional kind of a, just a thing that became almost a stronghold, like a cloud, like a something. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah.
Right? Oh, I get it. Oh, missing somebody's real. People, grieving is real. Paul just said we don't grieve as if we have no hope. So we have a greater belief in what's coming through Christ than what we've lost right now. But grieving's very real. It just should never subdue us to where it owns our countenance or our disposition. So we don't grieve as if we have no hope. What made you raise your hand? Did you feel like God ministered to you? Like something? Yeah, yeah just, just a relief and just something changed. No, I can see that in your confidence and in your speech right now. I totally get that. That's good. No, you're showing that. Yay, yay. Anybody else? You say you were healed and you want to give a testimony and then we're going to, we'll be wrapping up soon. Come on, there was a bunch of people that said they were healed. You don't be as shy to talk about it. Who was healed? Who, who wants to tell me what happened? Yeah, yeah, shout it out. What was causing that? Was it all the time? All the time and you didn't have to look hard for it. Or you could find it. So now you can't find it. It's completely gone. Come on, guys, that's just beautiful stuff. Do you understand that I just taught a long time and turned you guys loose? Did you notice I didn't pray over top of you guys? I didn't pray loud and pray over you guys. I just let you guys pray for each other. This is just you guys believing for each other. Who sees that's legitimate and awesome? Anybody else have a quick testimony? You were healed? You were healed? I know there was a bunch of hands. Who's being shy about testifying? You can't be shy about testifying. Who was healed in their body? You have a testimony? Yeah? Go ahead. My heels always hurt, but it was just because I was standing so long, so my arm was heavy. But then I stood to pray for my arm. Okay, and you weren't even getting prayer for that? And you noticed that left while you were praying for her? And something changed in your body? Mine was uh, ovarian cancer. Okay. So you had the pain when they were praying? All night, night, even during my amazing sermon? (laughs) Mm, That bugs me. But you had the pain all night. You stood up, they started praying for you, and boom, it left. And it's not because we played your favorite song. Did you notice I made the room pretty dry? Let me ask you this. I know you all sat down because you're probably tired and it's late, and you see I'm wearing out. Who's here, we prayed for you all this time, and you've been believing and listening to a few testimonies, but your body hasn't changed at all yet. Let me see who you are, please. Your body's still the same. Let me see. Is your person, look, can you stand up for me so your person can see you? You're not getting another person. (laughs) Hey, if that's your person, please run to them real quick. Please run to them real quick if that's your person. Put your hand up so they see you. When they get to you, put your hand down just so everybody gets to everybody. I think you all did that quick. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Now, this is going to be fun. Listen, listen. This is important. Who knows this is the biggest part that we struggle with when we pray for the sick? Getting afraid of nothing happening, the people what they believe about nothing happening, the people that prayed feeling like they ain't anointed or they're doing something wrong. It's called let's never stop believing. Because once you get in this roulette of questioning and all this stuff, then you're all thrown off course, right? Let's lock in to what we believe and never change. Does that make sense? So here's what I need you to do. Whatever you prayed, them first five seconds, just pray that again. I'm not saying quote it like a parrot, but don't grab for straws and add scripture and try to pray more powerful. That's called works. Nobody gets healed that way. And you just get frustrated. Simple faith. Pray the same five-second belief over them, proving that we believe. Amen? Go ahead. Pray for them. Five, six seconds. Same faith. Thank you, Lord. Man, that's good. That's beautiful. Okay, guys, start to wrap that up. Yep, wrap that up in Jesus' name. That's good. Now, here's what I need you to do. There's no pressure on anyone. We're just privileged to believe. Because a Christian never changes his mind. Check your bodies for me. Be, be, just be, bear with me for a minute. One more time. Please check your bodies thoroughly. And tell me if anyone in this room's changed that time, that last time. Let me know if you've changed when you find out. Everybody should be checking. Did you change? You hadn't changed at all this whole time. Okay. Changed. 
Okay. Did it completely go? You don't have, so you're, you completely got healed on that last time. <laughs> Guys, check this out. Nothing happened the whole time until right then. Wonder if we draw a conclusion based on experience. Wonder if we say, well, we must be doing something wrong. Well, it ain't God's time. Well, maybe he's doing this for a reason, honey. He's probably trying to teach you. All that crazy stuff we say that Jesus never said. And look what happens. Boom. If we change our mind, we might miss the boom. If we stay locked in, we might get that, right? Check your bodies. Anybody else? Bodies changed. Anybody else in the room change? Anybody at all? Anybody, not even at 100, just something. Anybody something, I'm asking. Just asking. Check your bodies. I'm giving you time to, to know. The fact that this lady stood up, what? What's that? Yeah? And they're completely gone? So you can hold them out and be completely... Did you ever have that diagnosed? Were you concerned about it? Or it was just, you just couldn't... It was like a tremor. You, you don't have it at all. Her hands were tremoring. They're completely calm and still, and she's at peace. And she got totally... I can see they're totally calm. That's powerful. Guys... This is why we believe. So watch this. So if we prayed for you and nothing changed up until now, it's not failure. It's the fact that we're in the game, man. We're believing. We're, we're releasing the kingdom. So let's keep faith. Faith, watch this. The person that prayed for them should leave here not going, man, what was I doing wrong? I should have got somebody else to pray. No, no. Father, thank you for the honor of touching them in faith and believing your love and finished work. God, I'm so excited. Thank you for what you're doing in their body. Hello? The person that was prayed for, wow, Father, thank you for what you're doing in me. I so appreciate them standing with me in faith. I know you love me. Thank you for what you're doing in my body. Go to bed happy. Go to bed in faith, not, wow, what's wrong with me? I wonder what God's trying to teach me. Throw all that away and be thankful and proclaim. And that's how our bodies change. Guys, I'm 29 years into this thing. I've been aggressive the whole 29 years. Prayed for thousands of people and seen thousands of people prayed for. This is how our bodies change when we let faith stay faith and don't let anything change our mind. Are you with me? Just for encouragement in the room, and I know some people slipped out because it's late. If you were healed all the way or somewhat tonight, all the way or somewhat, all at the same time, go like this, all at the same time, just so the room can see just what's real and what God's doing in this room. All the way or somewhat. Look at this, guys. I don't know about you. That's encouraging. We probably ought to just keep praying for the sick all the time in our lives. Amen? I'm not saying you guys don't, Pastor. We got a lot of visitors. We got people from the community. What I'm saying is, let's live this way. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you. I'm not done. I'm just stopping. <laughs> Love you guys. If you filled out a connection card or a little card and you had a prayer request or something Aww. you wanted us, there's a, there is a basket just outside both doors. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Father, dismiss us from this place in your spirit, in your power, in your anointing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. If you want to contribute to Dan's ministry, you can just put your offering in the basket outside the, the main door. There'll be a basket outside the door.